Oh my god, Steve, help! What? I've just noticed that I am nude from the pants up. What am I to do? Wow, you're putting it. Exactly, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm getting that rock and roll Putin look, uh -huh. and I am just not fond of it. <laughs> my nipples are exposed, as well, well as my chest hair. Let me tell you, Ben, this is very fortunate for you, because today's show is sponsored by Clairvoyant Clothing. Oh my god, Clairvoyant Clothing? That sounds like something I could probably find on Instagram. Why, you could, at Clairvoyant Clothing Company. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. What are they going to do for me to help me with my upper nudity situation? <laughs> Upper nudity. <laughs> Upper nudity. <laughs> well, Ben, Clairvoyant Clothing is a horror and occult-themed casual clothing brand. They offer large eye-catching designs Ooh. as well as small chest pocket prints and even plain black tees, if that's more your style. Oh, man. You know what? I formerly was really into plain white tees, but I'm All past that phase right. now. But, hey, Stephen, I don't have tons of money in my pocket right now. Whatever am I to do? Are these expensive? Wow. Ben. T-shirts and tank tops start at just sixteen sixty six. <gasps> That's the pricing of the beast. The pricing of the beast. <laughs> and sizes range from small to three XL. So there's something for every gender, size, and shape. I'll take mine in extra medium. That's the mediumest. The, the most medium of all. <laughs> Wow, that's utterly fantastic, Steve. This yeah. is really going to help me get myself in line and get myself presentable to the public because I really want to go to Benihana. They got that sign up front that says, I got to wear a shirt. What's up with that bullshit? <laughs> I know. It's crazy. I don't it's know. Uh, free the nipple, I say. Exactly there right. There you go. I don't know what might be their best sellers. I might want to choose a popular one. Well, they sent us their two best sellers, the Death Tarot card design and Ooh. the Uncle Satan Wants You vintage poster design. Their best sellers. We put them on. I was digging it. Nice shirt, nice design, mm -hmm. and we took some pictures. So you can go check out our Instagram, see what they look like. All the cool kids are doing it. And exclusive. Boom. Stop the fucking presses, everyone. They're offering a discount to dead and lovely listeners. Do People what? listening to this show get a discount? Yeah. Just go to clairvoyantclothing.com and use the coupon code dead and lovely. That's all one word, dead and lovely. For six percent off your order. Oh my lord, that's absolutely fantastic! Go check out Clairvoyant Clothing and start looking like one of the cool kids right now. Woo! I'll tell you what, Steve. I've had something on my mind here recently. I want to run by it before I set it into action. Okay. I've had this idea that I want to try to start a new viral trend All right. across the internet of telling kids the newest, coolest party drug they need to get high. Okay. It's going to be doing shots of that liquid they put inside of bubble levels. <laughs> <laughs> this is green liquid? I mean, what is it anyway? Uh, who knows, man? I'm not really sure what it is. Fucking crazy. I bet it'll get you high. Uh-huh. But I think I'm going to make a video of maybe me sitting inside of my car ranting about it as a uh -huh. white person. Right. And that's definitely sure to get spread around a lot and oh, yeah. get people to try it. Yeah. Just sitting in your car outside of a like gas station. Yeah. You need to be wearing some Oakley sunglasses. Oh, obviously, And yeah. uh, a hat with a, a rebel flag or an American flag on it. Sure. Yeah. That's definitely then, a good start. Yeah. You start with... Y'all hear what these fucking millennials are doing now? They've moved on from Tide Pods. Now they're doing this thing they call bubbling. They oh, say, whew. they say, hey, Johnny, let's go behind the bleachers and get leveled out. <laughs> That's what they're trying to tell you to do. Get trying, leveled it'll out. really get you leveled out. You know what I mean? <laughs> these damn kids are drinking the stuff out of bubble levels. <laughs> get some high. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Welcome, dead and lovely <laughs> listeners, to the greatest horror movie review podcast in this multiverse and beyond. Why it's dead and lovely here with the host with the most. Why it's me, Uncle Ben. Hey, and your most level podcast host. <laughs> Hollywood Steve, man, I am level, bro. Oh, man, you sound pretty leveled out over there. Hey, you man. guys want to get leveled out, man? <laughs> <laughs> the Abaha jacket guy yeah. gets in on it, too. Uh, you sound like Catman Steve today, that's Steve. That's me, man. I am, uh, I've been sick. So, sick, dude. Yeah, sick. It started on Friday night whenever we were doing the streaming chat. Yeah, like, you had to duck out, didn't you? Yeah, it just came on, man. It was like, fuck you, pal. And I did not enjoy it. And it's been now, what, like 
Couple, Four, two, five three days. days. Yeah. That sucks, man. Did uh, I think John Latour took the reins from you on the chat and guided that thing on into the night? Probably did. Yeah, yeah. John what a man! Him. What a man! Uh-huh. What a mighty good man! What a Johnny good Latour! <laughs> <laughs> what were yeah. y'all watching? Uh, uh, Zat. This Zat. Was, yeah, Dave Bichet's choice. It is insane. It's okay. basically a creature from the Black Lagoon ripoff about a catfish monster. <laughs> And it's set in Florida, but like Florida, Florida, not like the Southern Like the Everglades, yeah. Florida. <laughs> like fucking super duper redneck Florida. Now, when you say it's a catfish monster, I assume that it was going around and instigating trouble, just kind of like trolling people and stuff, right? Yeah. It was well, catfishing. Uh, mostly it was, it was uh, calling lonely people and like getting them to send them money and stuff. Making and then, fake dating profiles, yeah. things like this. Yeah. What a monster! It was monstrous. It was terrible, <laughs> hard to watch. But yeah, it was it was insane, and there was like so much fucking exposition. It was ridiculous. I don't know. I don't know if I think they maybe tried to watch something after that. Uh, I was out of it, man. I was so fucking sick. Done, though, man. That yeah. sucks. Hope and you it's feel just better. been wiping me out. Well, like I know a lot of other people in the greater Tennessee region that yeah. have been getting all kinds of sinus beat down. My sinuses and stuff were going crazy last week. Yeah. Where we went to Asheville and all over yeah. North Carolina and stuff. But here in Tennessee, it now feels like fucking late October. Yeah, for it went no from reason. From the high nineties to a high of like eighty. Today, the low was fifty eight. Yeah, and there's like it's no humidity. Insane. Yeah, it's, I mean it's gorgeous. I had the windows open. Oh yeah, it's open great, great weather. Today. It's but been awesome. Yeah, my sinuses I think were just like fuck that. I know, dude. I feel like. And I think listeners of the show for a long time will probably notice, like, we generally spend the first maybe about six months of every year just sick. Yeah, repeating yeah. on and off being yeah. sick and being well. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> the later part of the year is yeah. pretty good, but. I feel like we might have some, like, real problem or something. <laughs> <laughs> might want to get checked out. Maybe maybe our podcast goes down in history because <clears throat> it's this, like, slow, gradual process of two guys that get together to talk about movies but figure out they actually have AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we just keep getting sick all the time. Like, like, I don't have bodies are like system. real good at fighting it off, though. Because like, <laughs> I think if you go unchecked, no AZT, none of the other drugs, I don't know that you would be in as good a health as okay. we are. All right, yeah. <laughs> I've had myself quite a busy week, Stephen. Before yeah. before I came over here, I just barely skidded into the driveway before you did. Yeah, I just had myself a dang old little adventure. So well, I'm, my sissy in law, yeah, yeah, and her boyfriend, yeah, they came I in know those from two. Uh, from China, where Chicken they, China, the Chinese chicken, exactly. Uh-huh. They they had a drumstick. Guess what? Brain stopped ticking. What? what? I know. That's crazy. So they came into town. We were uh, we were having ourselves just a lovely family get together. Went and had an Elsa's on, had a taco. Yeah. Okay. And then we went back to their place, and we were enjoying the lovely, oddly autumnal feeling weather uh-huh. around the fire pit. Just having a good little chat and stuff, sitting around the foyer, enjoying kith and kin. Yeah. And then my sister-in-law's dog got bullseye full-on sprayed by a skunk. Dude, I think people are going to start to not trust us. How is it possible that my dog has been sprayed by a skunk, your dog has yep. been sprayed by a skunk, and now your sister-in-law's dog? I know. It's been sprayed by a fucking skunk. All within a year. All within a like, year. Like, this is the third time in a year we've yeah. talked about <clears throat> skunk spraying our dogs. But that's that's the good thing. That's you knew what to do, right? Yeah, that's the thing, man. Like, my instincts kicked in immediately because uh-huh. everybody's like, oh my God, get the dog in the bath and put some soap on that thing. I said, no. I say the nay. <laughs> I said, yeah, because ever since you told me that trick, which maybe you guys didn't catch that, yeah. you can go online and just, just Google dog got sprayed by skunk it'll yeah. give you all the exact proportions and stuff but it's a very specific mixture of hydrogen peroxide yeah. baking soda yep. and a little bit of like dawn dish detergent yep. you mix it up in specific proportions don't get your dog wet nope. it'll just spread that earl around yeah because it's an oil it, it'll just yeah. spread it around yeah. and make it really seep into the pores and mm, stuff and just stick right. there so before you even get that dog wet you gotta soak them down with this solution let uh-huh. it sit 15 minutes or so something like that give them a good wash it works like a charm yeah works immediately uh-huh. um we the story was that my dog got sprayed and uh we didn't do the right thing. We immediately put her in the shower and then started looking at yeah, what to do. Yeah, then you start looking right. So, yeah, she still smelled like skunk just slightly for yeah, three months. Bit. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I remember that, man. It was just like just 
barely. Yeah. But if you do this stuff first, man, it works yeah. like a dang old gets rid of it. It's crazy. You'll become the talk of the town if you know what to do whenever your dog gets sprayed. That's well, what's true. kind of funny, though, is that... Man knows what to do when dogs <laughs> spray. The headlines will say. But I'll tell you what, man. We've had, I think, more skunks and rabbits... Yeah, around here in Tennessee than I think I've about ever seen. They are fucking everywhere. Yeah. Every day a whole in my yard, I think I see at least a dozen rabbits. They're everywhere. Skunks are great, though, because uh, they eat a lot of stuff that you don't like. Yeah, same with possums, yeah. too. You eat a lot of ticks, all kinds yeah, of stuff possums like that. are great. Yeah, way mm-hmm. to go, guys. Our dog has seemingly come to ignore skunks because there have definitely been times where i've seen a skunk in our yard and our dog i know she sees it that's one but she's just like what i don't see anything what do you mean (laughs) why would i chase something because there's nothing there exactly yeah i got no problems with this nothing's going on it's one of those old smelly cats in the yard so she maybe learned her lesson maybe not though right on yeah what have you been up to this week, Steve? You been doing anything? Well, it's been real sick. Yeah. So I've been sleeping a whole Ooh, hell of a wow. while. But I, I did um I did get to watch Frankenstein's Monsters Monster Frankenstein. That does not sound like a real thing, Steve. <laughs> it is a real thing, starring <laughs> David Harbour on Netflix. Okay. And it is it's weird. Is it and new? Yeah, it's pretty new. Is it about Frankenstein's monster making its own monster, as I might guess from the title? <sighs> no. It is about David Harbour trying to understand... David Harbour, apparently, is David Harbour III. This is not true. That's just the setup of the story. All right. And his father, or his grandfather, David Harbour Sr., put on this teleplay that he wrote called Frankenstein's Monster's Monster. Frankenstein. All right. And it is so confusing and weird. And it's presented as like a documentary, but it also shows the the teleplay. Oh my God. That sounds awesome. It's so weird. I loved it. It was so fun. Is it funny? Yeah, it's funny. Uh huh. And David Herbert just plays it all so straight. Killer. Just great. Really funny. Awesome. I got to check that out. It's on the Netflix. Yeah, it's Netflix. It's, a, a, it's probably about 30 minutes, I think. Oh, okay. Cool. An easy watch. Yeah. I also watched a Star Wars. You watched the Star Wars? Which Star Wars did you see? Um, uh, New Hope. Yeah, Star yeah. Wars 4, the fourth Star Wars. Yeah, it was a big inspiration for Alien, so I was like, I just might Refresh as well yourself. rewatch it. Okay. And I watched the Despecialized Edition, because I wanted to see what Ridley Scott was seeing, and what, what like, really made him go like yeah i want to make a space movie too oh okay so you watch like the original theatrical not filled with cgi bullshit yeah, absolutely no cgi awesome. just beautiful that's the only way it should be watched yeah. mm-hmm. and the models look great oh god it looks yeah. so good man. i we mean, watched it only like a month or so ago yeah it's the cantina so awesome. scene is a little silly because it's just every costume they could find Whatever was laying around in the prop room, basically. Yeah, and it's like, okay, you got all these different types of aliens, and then we never see any of those types of aliens again. <laughs> ever. But I do want to see an entire side story about our good friend, the Space Wolf. The Space Wolf. The there Space are Wolf. entire side stories. In fact, there was a Chewbacca mini series, uh, a mini run of comic books mm-hmm. that had, I can't remember the name of the species of Space Werewolf. But that's a specific thing. Yeah, and huh. it, it, they were involved in it. But yeah, I would say any one of the creatures has probably had some side story written about it because people are, you know... Oh, they go deep on that. Yeah, on super. That stuff. I got some questions, though, about a space wolf. Now that I'm thinking about this. Yeah. If you are a werewolf in uh-huh. space, perhaps you're on, on another planet, Uh huh. does any old moon turn you into a werewolf? Well, they were on a planet with two moons. That's what I'm saying. Like, if you're if yeah. you're there and you got two moons coming out, do you right. turn and then unturn, or do you like turn into a werewolf and then the second moon turns you into like is a there mega like, wolf? Yeah, you know? is there like a time where they're both full and you're mega wolf? Yeah, yeah exactly. But it is a good question because a lot of these other planets have like five moons and stuff like this. Yeah, but space werewolves open up a ton of things to me. Also, yeah. it made me think of. Laser vampires. Laser vampires. Why aren't there vampires that can use lasers to extract your blood for some reason? Oh my god! Yeah, okay. laser vampires. I'm I want like that. future tech vampires, and I want space monsters, and I don't want them to look like a gleep glop. I want them to look like a <laughs> fucking Frankenstein. I want a fucking planet of Frankenstein's. Did you see what I was talking about whenever I watched it not too long ago? Where I was like, Luke sees the charred corpses yes. of his family, and he's like. 
Eh. Eh. Whatever. Eh. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Guess um you guys wanna Star War? He kinda gets over it. Yeah. A little easily. It's true. It's <laughs> way quick. And it's not like the, he's there's no like no yeah, or yeah. anything. It's just like, oh, all right. All right then. Are you gonna like go through and watch the other ones now? Did no, I, mean? I was just watching okay. I had some big plans before I got sick. I was gonna watch all the alien movies. Yeah, oh wow. That's a um, lot. and I got I watched one, two, and three. You put a dent in yeah. it, a sizable dent. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I was also going to try to watch Dark Star and 2001 yeah. because they're both big, big inspirations. Yeah. On I this. never seen Dark Star. Oh, you haven't? No. Okay. Well, Dark I mean, Star. It's John Carpenter. I mean, it's John Carpenter. So. It's yeah, it's his student film that he and Dan O'Bannon made. But like, it's it's like a comedy sort of. Okay. And they're destroying planets. Like that's their job. So. There's some inspiration there that probably went into Star Wars, too. Mm. I don't know if George Lucas has ever talked about that. But, um, yeah, Dark Star was... It's interesting. Badass creature design. Beach ball. Just a beach ball. It's just yeah, a beach just ball. Just a paint, painted. spray-painted beach ball. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I need to sit down and watch that sometime. Uh-huh. I, myself, have had just a crazy fucking jam-packed week trying to get ready for a upcoming vacation yeah. which I'm very excited about. You're going to the beach. I'm going right near the beach. Right near Bye. the beach. <laughs> so you got to stand like across the street from the beach. Yeah, yeah. And be like, oh, hey, okay. look at that over there. Hmm. Huh. We're sure. near it. So that also means that I've just been trying to get a whole, you know, extra two weeks or so worth of stuff like completed in advance yeah. for YouTube and the podcast. And right. Yeah. So I've been super fucking slammed, but as I've been uh, running around like a, a chicken with my head cut off, yeah, I've been casting. Been casting? I've been cold, cold casting. Oh, yeah? So I've not really watched anything this week to speak of, but I've been listening a lot to This Might Get Weird, Okay, which is a podcast by two YouTubers. It's by uh-huh. Mamrie Hart and Grace Helbig. Okay. Do you know, I know of them? them. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Mamrie Hart uh, first came onto my radar with the You Deserve a Drink stuff that she does, which is always fun and okay. funny. But dude, their podcast is so fucking hilarious. It's okay. not really about anything. Like it, it's just them just basically getting together and talking about whatever they did that week. All right, and because yeah. they're like both online personalities, you know, living in L.A., uh-huh. their average week is a lot different than ours. Where it's like I worked and I watched something. Like yeah. they kind of actually have stuff to talk about. Yeah, it, dude, living in so L.A. Funny. does give you a lot more experience. Like just walking around because, like, uh, Simbad, you he said this like. He was a lot funnier when he was riding the bus than when he was making a lot of money and getting driven around in limos and stuff. Yeah, yeah, because you see Because you see yeah. crazy shit. That was my favorite thing about L.A. Like, I could walk out my door to go to the store, and I know I'm going to probably have a story to tell. Like, the one time I saw a guy just bend down and pick up a dog shit and say, Somebody put some poop in the yard. <laughs> I remember you talking yeah. about that. <laughs> Just grabbed it bare hand. I was like, Fuck. That's, that's not something I would do that at all. That is crazy. <laughs> awesome i wouldn't have seen that because here you can't just walk around you have to drive somewhere to go walk around right right like it's the craziest shit (laughs) so i didn't really get a whole lot of time to watch anything other than the subject of our show today which is one alien alien aliens aliens that that sounds like (laughs) Like, when Alien came out, they should have had... Oh, man. He could have been at Cinnabon. Oh, when yeah. They, we've already suggested that they do the Cinnabites. The Cinnabites. Uh-huh. They could have had, like, some sort of cinnamon thing you bite into, and it's got, like, green stuff in the middle. Ooh, it's an Alien. Aliens. I think yeah. maybe what it is is it's almost like a, a big, like, uncoiled pretzel that kind of looks like a face hugger. With all kinds of little like arms shooting <laughs> you off. You could of it. make a pretzel that looked like a face hugger. Yeah, that would be do awesome. That pretty easily, actually. <laughs> that would be the Alium. Alium. Auntie Annie's. <laughs> Auntie Ripley's. Aliums. Aliums. <laughs> Auntie Ripley's. <laughs> but this month only. <laughs> Which uh, we're going to be talking about that today. And of course, this is one of those ones that I was super, super, super stoked yeah. to check out for the this show. This is a classic. It is. I mean, seriously, there's going to be a lot of just gushing about how well, yeah. fucking awesome well, this movie is. It, 
I don't know how there wouldn't be. I don't know how anybody would watch this and be like, I don't get it. I know. Like, what kind of fucking prick could watch this movie and be like, yeah, I don't know. It's never good. Yeah. Oh, it's so amazing. And of course, one of the things about this movie that's so goddamn fantastic yeah. is, of course, the legendary creature design by one H. Har Giger. Which, dude, I swear, man, I think the design of the Xenomorph, as it would become known, yeah. is among the greatest creature designs in oh, all of history. Maybe the best. Yeah. It's just absolutely incredible, yeah. man. So I think before we get into to just wanking and gushing about this movie like we're going <laughs> to, I say that we just maybe set a, a toe or two into the waters of the Preview Palace. Welcome to the Preview Palace. And maybe we just spend a little bit of time here listing out a few of our favorite creature designs yeah. in movie history. And I'm not talking any kind of humanoid. I'm not talking right. about like a former person, like a like a Dracula. Right. Or maybe even a Terminate. Yeah. And he looks I, like a man. We're not talking about animals like, you know, the shark from Jaws or right. anything like that. We're, we're not talk- talking about creatures God made. Yeah. We're talking about creatures made by Satan himself. <laughs> So I think that we should just go ahead and bust this thing, uh, bust this thing bust down. Bust it wide here. open. Bust it wide open. Mm-hmm. Oh, why don't we just go ahead and get one of the obvious ones out of the way here? Because you can't talk about alien and not also talk about a predator. Yeah, yeah. Predator is one of the most intimidating creature designs ever. Oh my like, god, it's the fucking coolest. It's yeah. got all these like tribal aspects, but also all these like high tech the kind thing, of things going on. Like because. They do in the Predator. Go check out our Predator episode where we talk about this. But they do yeah. the good job of not showing the Predator too much mm-hmm. early on. But the thing is that that creature design looks so good, you want to show it off. So at the end, we see it a lot. Mm-hmm. And it looks fucking awesome. And you just want to see more. Yeah. That's the thing about it. Like in a lot of these movies where they're kind of like coyly showing you bits and pieces of a creature, but not yeah. showing you the whole thing. And then finally, towards the end of the movie, they start showing it a lot. And you're like, ah. It really should not have shown it that much because right. it's kind of spoiled the illusion. Uh-huh. Predator is one of those things where the whole movie you're just like, oh my god, what the fuck is this thing? It's and then amazing. when you see it, you're like, what oh the fuck god, is this that fucking thing? sick? It's yeah. so cool. Aliens kind of that way too, where yeah. it's like, show that thing all you yeah, want. The more to, you it's show it, the more awesome. it's just like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah, the Predator design is completely awesome. I remember. Uh, you know, of course, not watching it when I was a kid, obviously. I did, though. Yeah. You were cool. I, I was, was cool uncool, kid. man. You were sitting at home like, I wonder what scare is. <laughs> What's a scare, mom? <laughs> I used to say. Yeah. And she was like, hell. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why you're afraid of movies yeah. with the fucking devil in them. It all goes back to that. Yeah. The thought of my mom, especially my mom like in the 80s, yeah. being that aggressive yeah. and using that voice is endlessly she's amusing like, to me. Hell. Hell. And then she's like, want a grilled cheese, sweetie? Hell of shit. Oh my God, that's so good. But I remember seeing ads for like the Predator video game and like Game oh, Pro yeah. magazine. Yes. And being so like, had, oh my like, God, that thing had, was so cool. It had Arnold Schwarzenegger, I remember, on the, the what is it? The oh, like thing the you box. put into the oh the cartridge the cartridge yes <laughs> that old <Fuck>. thing <laughs> um, but in the yeah in the ad you could see the predator too yeah, yeah dude and I was like oh my god I always I always wanted to know what predator was and then yeah. I finally saw the movie and I'm like predator sick it is so yeah. awesome what yeah. else we got here on our on our list Steve of top creature designs well Ben another one we've talked about in the past is the Brundle fly yeah from the fly yes, from the fly oh my god dude what an awesome disgusting gross yeah. design it's not really a a singular design it kind of no. evolves even there towards the end of the movie it's cracking out of its own yeah. husk and changing yeah it's uh it's gross real real gross it always looks pretty sticky yeah you know, yeah, where like the alien always looks wet. He's very and damn. drippy. Yeah, the yeah the fly always looks sticky. Like yeah, you I, it makes you kind of want to wash your hands. He definitely looks like he needs several moist paper towels before he can get on the furniture. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, could you imagine, dude? You invite Jeff Goldblum to your party, right? Of course, you would, as you would. Yeah, but you don't know it, but you unwittingly get Brundle. Over. Yeah, he's sitting on your couch, just greasing that thing up. 
my god Greasing up your couch Yeah you knock on the bathroom door and Fuck it's, your and, it, and it's locked And then he comes out And you look at the commode seat And it's just covered in all kinds of oh, goo Oh man Just like Brundle Clean Who that up Who the toilet <laughs> Take a wild guess Yeah And you gotta act all casual about it You gotta be uh, like What do you mean Guys Somebody Dude here just tripping off I, mean, I don't know It could have been anybody Somebody here I'm not pointing fingers I'm not yeah. naming names mm-hmm. But there's a mess in the bathroom. It's a sticky goo. I'm not even going to guess what it is. I think Janine may have done it. Uh, okay, so Janine's a possibility, <laughs> but uh, again, I'm not pointing <laughs> fingers at anyone, but whoever it is, just go in there and clean it up. Yep. Because it's a sticky mess. I'm not cleaning that shit up. That's Janine. <laughs> oh, that's Janine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she knows damn well who right. it is. She's not really as coy as the rest of us. What a cool design, though, man. And I love how it constantly evolves, and you can really yeah. see the DNA just getting yeah. all mixed together there. So and that's really, yeah, that's because, like, early on, it's just body horror, but still human. Yeah. But it's when he finally gets that final form when it becomes creature. But it's not a human anymore. It's like, what the fuck is that thing? I'll tell you yeah. what it is. It's gross. It's, a, it's gross. It's grody. Listen, we don't need no fly people <laughs> coming into our schools, taking our welfare, taking our jobs. These damn fly people. There was a fly person in front of me in the ER the other day. What? He was getting took care of before me. Do what? He was making the seats all greasy. Yuck. Greasy and sticky like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one of my favorites in horror history. Mm-hmm. It's one that we talked about on, I think, an episode number dose really? of this very podcast. Damn. Way back in the day. It's a little feller, what's called Pumpkinhead. Oh, yeah. What a design. Stan Winston. And Stan it, Winston. it looks similar to the Alien. Stan Winston had worked on Aliens. Right. And come up with something that looks similar to the alien but has more expressiveness because yeah, it has it eyes and and stuff but that design looks great oh man it's so cool and again that's one of those ones where at first they're not really showing exactly what it is but yeah then you later see some full-on shots and uh-huh. that thing walking around and it's a dude and those crazy stilt feet and uh-huh. all that stuff you don't really feel like you're watching a rubber suit monster no you don't you know what i mean yeah it looks really good and it's like you said it kind of has giger aspects about it yes some it does. of those like ribs and bony looking mm. structures that are all over it oh man it's so badass it's super cool not really my favorite movie like yeah I don't no love the story is not amazing but the look is great oh man so badass dude yeah Pumpkinhead definitely deserves a mention on Old any list head. of horror creeps who are you thinking of next Hollywood Steve well Ben little movie called The Thing Pilgrim oh you don't say yeah you don't say that thing has got some creatures in it yeah. I will tell you this they are uh, indescribable and can't they can't be nailed down to what one thing it's basically just off yeah everything is off it doesn't yeah. really get how to put the human parts together to look exactly human at first and right. those things look crazy well because that's the thing is like ultimately this alien has apparently been going all over the galaxy yeah collecting parts of god knows what's dna uh-huh. and mixing them together so it's like i love whenever it, it you know first spawns out of that dog yes and it's like you can tell it's trying to figure out what a dog is but what is not dog? really getting it right exactly yeah it's like when you ask a kid to draw a dog and it's like, uh-huh. Ugh, it's like, no, it didn't turn out right. <laughs> you don't know what a dog looks like, you idiot. Stupid kid. Yeah, exactly, dude. Dumbass. Go to art school, kid. Seriously. Get a worthless degree. I'm only five. <laughs> That's no excuse. No excuse. <laughs> Get yourself in debt, kid. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but like whenever it starts trying to, to imitate people and stuff, like yeah. whenever it gets inside of a dude and it, 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 his chest thing bites that feller's yeah, arm off. His ribs turn into teeth. Basically. Oh my lord. Yeah. That usually doesn't happen. Not normal. That's not the normal thing. rib teeth. Yeah, not normal. Yeah. Mine as of as of so far yeah. have stayed stayed put pretty well and as far as i know have never chewed anything up so that's what makes it so weird do you get it yeah yeah i see why that's odd odd. yeah yeah okay now oh wow now that that scene is scarier for me Uh uh-huh because before i was like well that never happens Mm -hmm. well usually what it is from our perspective is we're the ones that eat ribs right yeah but now the ribs eat you do what (laughs) 
<laughs> and I'm fall off the bone, baby. <laughs> Why does a McRib not have bones? I've never eaten a McRib. They just I have taken me. a bite of a McRib as a kid, expecting it to be like ribs, and it's like just a beef patty in that weird shape. Is it beef? I, I think it's just their normal animal beef meat stuff. <laughs> In like, sauce. pressed into this weird mold that makes it look kind of like kind ribs, and then just slathered in bar- their barbecue sauce. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, as gross as it is to think about eating this impressionistic rib patty <laughs> made of mystery meat, yeah. At the same time, though, could you imagine if you went to McDonald's? And you got a rib sandwich that was full of bones, and you're just yeah. like every bite, you're just like, like, like a they bone. Just put it between two pieces of bread. Like here, fucking it's eat like, it. What's the point of this? There's Seriously, bones though, in like every other bite. I'm just now thinking about it. The McRib <laughs> seems like something that HR Giger would have come up yeah. with. Like McDonald's was like, we want to work with that guy from Alien. What do you? What ideas do you have? And he's like, what if a sandwich had bones in it? What if we are pressing? the meat in a machine yes. and we are giving it sort of a biomechanical um, rib structures on top of the surface of this nasty meat <laughs> and then you are coating it in a disgusting sauce like blood coat it in blood and they're like uh, barbecue sauce <laughs> maybe <laughs> but, maybe that but okay yeah we'll do it <laughs> it is a nightmarish uh-huh. sandwich isn't yeah. it <laughs> I bet he also came up with the shamrock shake he was like yeah. what if you had a shake that had alien blood <laughs> and they were like mm, mint how about mint <laughs> maybe mint instead <laughs> I don't know I'm still waiting for that Ken shamrock shake Ken <laughs> shamrock put you on fucking ankle <laughs> exactly <lock. laughs> right yeah <laughs> you only get the shake after you tap out yeah that's it <laughs> <laughs> and you're like it hurts so much I'm shaking they're like that's the shamrock shake you got that shamrock shake <laughs> <laughs> oh my god dude ooh McRib so ooh, gross McRib <laughs> come to think of it I think like the brundle fly and some of the stuff from the thing kind of looks like they're just made out of McRibs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe if we ever get to do a monster movie, we it just basically like so, just cover something in McRibs. Cover something in McRibs, and it's like <laughs> this is nightmare fuel. <laughs> I guarantee there are a ton of people listening right now who love the McRib. People I'm sure. love the people McRib. People are crazy. I mean, it's yeah. always coming back. If it's so good, yeah. how come it doesn't just stick around, y'all? Yeah, I think that's one of those things where, like, I, I. Oh. Always hated that you know Hardee's, aka Carl's Jr. They yeah. used to have that like jalapeno thick burger. Oh right, yeah. I don't know if they still do it, but they only do it like once in mm. in the year for like a month. Mm-hmm. Man, I think so good. Anyway, maybe it's maybe it's essentially because it's kind of like like Motley Crue or Kiss, where it's like they constantly threaten not being around anymore, and yeah. that's what makes people go see them. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but if they had easy access to them, they're like, oh god, I can go see Kiss nah. anytime. Yeah. I could eat a McRib anytime. It's just nasty meat. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get nasty meat, please? <laughs> no, sir. a nasty meat sandwich. <laughs> I'll tell you what, a trimmer kind of looks like it's something that... Yeah, man. That's that, a that real was, cool that creature could be design. made out of pressed meat. That's true. Perhaps. It's a, just a big old worm with a spiky throat and a big t- tongue. Tongue that thing? Like, it was like three... Tongues ish, I think. Yeah, it's a lot of something. Yeah, I'll tell you that. Man. I know what I like. I like Fritos. <laughs> Quoth Reba <laughs> McIntyre. Reba McIntyre. <laughs> Quoth the in, Reba. In never Trimmers. more. Yeah. <laughs> like seriously, if Tremors had ended with her just turning to the camera and going, "I know what I like. I, I like, like Fritos. Fritos." The end. Yeah, I'd have been like ten. ten. Easy ten. Yeah. We talked about that movie on our podcast. It's true. It's a great creature, man. It looks great, and it's real basic. Practical. Real, all practical, basic stuff. Looks awesome. Does the job. Mm-hmm, that's yeah. right. I'll tell you one of my favorites, too, from recent horror history. What that is. That is kind of humanoid in a sense, I suppose, but it's so just goddamn nightmarish yeah. and terrifying. I'm talking about a, a Baba Duke, 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 Duke. Man, that Baba Duke. Duke. Woof. Yeah. That's man. a wolf, for sure. It's great. It's a great character design. It really Memorable. does look like something that would come out of uh, the children's books of our youth. The Richard Scary, the, yeah. the pop-up uh, book of nightmares and uh-huh, the, phobias and shit. 
uh, uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, uh-huh. a movie coming out soon, August That's right. 9th. That's yeah. right, man. Yeah, dude, it is it is pure nightmare fuel. And I'm usually not into the whole thing where it's like they're trying to make childish stuff like dolls or whatever seems scary to us or like yeah. especially like just that that typical horror trope of having some creepy children's song or a yeah. little kid, kid singing, singing like, yeah. fuck that it's not fucking scary to me at all mm. but there's something about the design of the babadook that is really unnerving mm. and again you're never really sure of exactly what he looks like i mean he's got a trench coat and a hat and a fucked up face and but these weird like pointy fingers he does have pointy fingers that's a strange thing to oh, have for a man. person that what scene if it's just freddy like oh, yeah? he's caked makeup on and he's put like he's in a goth over. phase yeah but there's something about that design especially like when she's in bed yeah and she's like kind of hiding under the covers and it's crawling across the ceiling yes. and they kind of do that like chopped frame rate uh-huh. thing too which again usually also doesn't work for me but it worked here oh my god dude it is so fucking creepy and cool that's a good episode that we did on that one too critically acclaimed critically by acclaimed, our fans that's true. yeah and some of them are probably critics of other things so everybody's a critic everybody's a critic <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Ben, there are a lot of werewolf movies out there. There are. And um, everybody's got their favorite werewolf design. Mm-hmm. But I think mine is Dog Soldiers. Dog Soldiers, the, those things look great They in looked there. great. They look the most like a wolf. Yeah, tall, lean, spindly. Yeah. yeah they look I really hungry. enjoyed them. Hungry and mean. I mean, there are a ton of other great iterations of the werewolf american werewolf in london has probably the best transformation scene oh the best yeah. absolutely so i love the little glimpse that we get of that kind of werewolf beast in bram stoker's dracula yeah. it's not really a true werewolf but yeah oh man i think that thing looks so sick it is good there's a lot of real shitty ones that werewolf in silver bullet looks so <laughs> shot i love silver bullet the though. werewolf in um monster, monster squad. squad not great oh he looks yeah. so bad dude the werewolves in uh, there's a movie called Late Phases. Okay, little, I've heard you talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I liked that. They they looked a little different, I guess. Maybe a little more like that. A little more like what they did in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Okay. A little bit more like that beastly human like. look, but bestial. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I really enjoyed that one. Right on, man. But yeah, yeah those, Dog Soldiers, I think, is, is my favorite. And it's iteration. awesome, too, because like, like like we talked about in our episode, the faces aren't really articulated. No. But they also made a wise choice to never have them like, growl or, God forbid, talk. Right. Or like, howl or do anything that, that would require would like insane. lip motions or anything. If they were just like, hey, hey, I'm a, a werewolf. Moon's out, huh? That's crazy. I'm kind of hungry. Is there... Oh, wait. I was going to say, is there one where werewolves talk? Of course there is. I mean, wolf talk for, for one. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. You're a wolf. Cop. <laughs> you know, while we're on the subject of werewolves, let's talk a little bit about vampires. A vampire. Now, usually when you think of a vampire, you're thinking of a suave, handsome debonair. Yeah, it's not a creature. Maybe even sparkly. Right. Sexy person. It's very human still. Very human. But sometimes you see a vampire yeah. that is just, I'm talking cuckoo bananas. And sometimes you see several different types of vampire all in one movie. Sometimes one even comes from a really very attractive latina woman <laughs> yeah who's uh currently gonna be in the mcu oh That's no shit Alma Hayek. yeah what's she gonna be uh in the what's that one the jap kirby thing fucking shit that's the one she's gonna be in fucking the eternals shit. the eternals uh, really the eternals? i've got the big graphic novel that i'm gonna read it on vacation yeah look forward to that that's cool, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, From Dust Till Dawn. Yes. Which uh, we talked about it in our episode on From Dust Till Dawn. That basically, it just seems like they let everybody who was there who did makeup mm-hmm. do their own thing. Yeah, just have fun with it. So Greg like, Nicotero and co. just yeah. running wild. There's- Selma, Selma Hayek's got this like serpentine yeah. thing going on. There's like a wolf-ish one. Uh-huh. Some, some have a very bat-like appearance with yeah. like a split nose mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah, they're just all over the map, and they yeah. all look gross. I, yeah. I also would not invite them into my car. I'd have to put a beach yeah. towel or something down for them and be like, I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend you, but you are just clearly gross. just covered in some sort of fluid, <laughs> and I'm not sure if I can get it out of my upholstery. So just please <laughs> sit on this towel. Please, sir. 
Just please, okay? <laughs> I'll they, invite you in. Just sit on the fucking towel. Well, and they also seem to be very full of goo. They were gooey. <laughs> full of goo. Yeah, I would just describe them as gooey. Gooey. In general. That's yeah. how I would I would describe them. Now, there are some, I mean, some of those vampires are the more humanoid looking ones, but I, specifically the serpentine Selma Hayek and the wolf one are just full on creatures. Like, very, it doesn't cool. look like a human really anymore. I'll tell you what a full-on creature is that I think is incredible. Just a little bit outside of the horror realm. Yeah. But I'm going to say that it counts because it's also a Ridley Scott realm. What? That's right. I'm talking about Mother Night. I'm talking about fucking Tim Curry Uh as Darkness from Legend. Yeah. Oh my God, man. Legend is amazing. And again, it's it's really more fantasy, but there's Mm -hmm. some scary shit in there. Yeah, it scared me as a kid. There's also some great goblins and stuff in there too. Blix, you remember the little goblin feller? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, he looks kind of greasy too. Yeah. (laughs) But dude, that design of Tim Curry as Darkness, which is basically just Satan. demon, yeah. Yeah. And it's like... A Satan like what you kind of imagine from old school, olden times. Olden times. He's got Satan. the big old hooves. He's all red and super jacked and ripped. Uh-huh. Huge what horns coming out of his like head. Like training regimen, you think? Dude, he must not have a single carb down there in hell. He has not That's had a carb in That's probably why it is hell. That's no probably, yeah, exactly. It's probably why he's so angry all the time. Yeah. I, I am currently trying to eat forty, only 40 carbs a day. Dude, and no. It's real fucking hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because you know what's in carbs? The best things in life. Mm -hmm. What you going to do? Not have a pasta? Not have a noodle? That is what I'm currently doing. It sucks. (laughs) See, that's the thing. I could live with that bread. I really could. I could go with that bread. Yeah. But I just have recently started thinking, it's like, oh, yeah, pasta is just long bread. It is just long bread. It's long That's bread. True. <laughs> I'll have some long bread and, so, and marinara sauce. That's a great way just to confuse the fuck out of yeah. you. I'll have the long bread, please. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah, it's like a long... Yeah, it's like a long bread. It's like real, like... It's real thin. Breadsticks, sir? Are you talking Thinner about the... Than that. Uh, Thinner than that. Like the really crispy, thin ones that they have out sometimes. Is He's that talking about spaghetti, brother. <laughs> That's the guy from the other table. Yeah, he knows. He gets it. He's been stoned before. <laughs> and then later on, that guy gets fucking kicked out because they see him breaking open a, uh, a bubble level and drinking the food. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to get leveled, man. <laughs> hey, man, it ain't against the law. <laughs> Thought this is America, man. It, it, it isn't. It's true. It's, it's true. not against the law to d- drink the stuff inside of a bubble level. <laughs> what is it? I want to know, Who man. I can't imagine. I want to know about it. Uh, <laughs> Um, I will I'll go ahead and say for legal reasons, we do not endorse drinking yeah, the fluid drink inside that. of bubble it's levels. Pr- probably would get you under leveled. Yeah, probably. But yeah. You'd lose a level. You'd get off balance. Uh huh. The next time you play Dungeons and Dragons, your DM would be like, sorry, you lost a level, dude. Maybe, dude, maybe that's like, again, part of this whole subculture where it's like when you get the dosage just right, you're leveled out, but then when you like overdo it, it's like, <laughs> oh, he's off balance, man. Oh, shit, whoa. He's, <laughs> he's in cardiac arrest, man. <laughs> <laughs> that bookshelf's gonna fall. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, dude, the whole package of of, uh, of Satan being all jacked and yeah. ripped up from his underworld workouts. I think he's doing like Billy Blanks, Tybo. Down Probably Tybo, yeah. No <laughs> carbs, always Billy Blanks. definitely lifting weights, though. I'm pretty sure he yeah. is. And plus, of course, you know, Tim Curry's personification. Yeah, he's great. Of El Diablo and yeah. his voice and stuff. Just fucking amazing. I'd love to do Legend here on the show sometime. Yeah, we, I mean... I think we should at some point do a month of movies that scared people as kids. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily have to be horror movies. I mean, like Return to Oz is really scary. Yeah. Somebody on the Facebook group recently put up a thread. Was uh-huh. it David put up a thread about like what were movies that used to scare you when you were a kid? Yeah, I don't remember. I yeah. can't remember. Oh, yeah, it yeah. Up. It was David Will. Yeah. But it was a really, really good thread. And I was like, oh, man, this is so fun. Yeah. Like for me, it was like Pee Wee's Big Adventure or like Large Marge oh, yeah. and shit. That was, oh, my God. Yeah, scared for the me, hell the out Wizard of Oz, the original the winged monkeys especially when they tear apart the scarecrow it's just like what the fuck way metal out of nowhere (laughs) way metal yeah it'd be fun to do a month of movies like that that would be a good time all right, one more here on our list, Steve. What are we going to talk about here? What's a, what's a good old creature design you want well, to go had, out We on? had to pick just one movie by Guillermo del Toro because creature design is... 
kind of his bag. Kind of his bag. Yeah. yeah. I love and the design of that kind of gill man in the shape of water. Sure, right. Exactly. So cool, yeah. Man. So um, cool. But Pan's Labyrinth yeah. definitely has some of the best creatures he's ever yeah. designed. What do they call that? That feller in there that's got them eyeballs in his hands. Is that's all like eyeball that, hands. I think. Eyeball hand. Yeah. I think he's called eyeballs. Uh, eyeballs. Uh. <laughs> I think he's called like the pale man. The pale or, man or probably. Something, yeah, like something like that. He's got that gross like saggy kind of skin. Like uh-huh. old man flesh. Yeah. Oh god. Yeah. But then like. Yeah. He's like skinny but the flappy skin and then like just the long fingers with the, the eyes in the middle of the hands. Yeah. So gross. Oh man, what I would a, think that would lead to a lot of problems if you had yeah. your eyes in your hands. Jerking off would be really irritating. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> oh my god, that would be the worst. <laughs> that, that's probably why he's so angry. It's probably so. And also, I, you know what? I bet the reason his skin is so baggy, probably quit eating carbs. Oh man, lost he lost weight way too fast. Yeah, exactly yeah, so right. He's got that, that just flappy skin <laughs> he's got that skinny fat going uh-huh. on uh-huh you don't want that no but yeah the creature designs in that movie are just amazing and i know he's got other ones too uh that i just haven't seen i've never seen hellboy before yeah the hellboy well i mean hellboy was comic book before so i wouldn't give okay, him the yeah, credit yeah. for the designs but the designs are fucking awesome hellboy's really fun i think i've talked about it uh on yeah you've told me the show to before, see it. but yeah, yeah definitely worth watching i haven't seen the david harbour one people didn't really give it a lot of uh, good reviews, but I, I'm willing to give it a shot. But I mean, Ron Perlman as Hellboy is like just perfect, and they're a little wacky, funny. I mean, Jeffrey Tambor's in the first one. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of silliness to it, but also just like real cool creature design. Right on, man. Yeah. Let me check that out. You know, one more that I just happened to think of while we're going through this list that I really like that is not a major part of that movie, but I love the monster designs in In the Mouth of Madness. Oh, yeah. That monster wall. Oh, those are creepy as shit. And oh you, only, you, you can only see them briefly in a couple of frames. Yeah. Yeah, there's like a gill man sort of in the front. There's just this weird sort of... Like the the engineer in Hellraiser. Yeah. They got something kind of like that, that little, in there. That little uh, chicken nugget looking fella. Yeah. There's the... When the old lady gets the long neck out of nowhere. Mm, oh, oh my, my God, God. Dude, it's, it's so It's just making those weird. cat noises and chopping what up her... fuck? Husband with tentacles. God, I love that movie. That movie's dude. awesome. It's so cool. <laughs> but the creatures in that are, are Lovecraftian. Like, yeah. I don't even know top to bottom where the anatomy of this thing is. Yeah. It's just indescribable and strange. Yeah. So cool, man. So yeah, cool. Yeah, it's such a great... Man, Great. all this talking about carbs, it just made me realize yeah. I'm a little decarbed myself, yeah. man. I think I'm going to have to get myself some carbohydrates in the form of a, a cold, solid pull. Yeah. A pull I, of I beer. I didn't eat any carbs today so I could have this. Ooh, wow. Yeah. Way to go, man. I wonder how many how many carbs might be in one of these things. It, it depends on yeah. the type of beer, but it, it's going to be at least around 20. It's generally so all it's like bad. half of what I could get in a day. All right. I'm going to yeah. call that worth it. That is worth it, yeah. Because what we're having today is a beer from right here in right Knoxville, here. Tennessee, from our friends over at Pretentious Brewing Company. Yeah. And we're drinking these out of these beautiful glasses made by Pretentious yeah, Glass. these are awesome. Our solving in glasses, which are very sick. You see these in the Instagram posts. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So I'll tell you what. I went down there the other day to get a beer to go for the show, and they had all kinds of really amazing delicious delicious things on tap but i specifically had to get this one for this particular movie since okay. it's set out in space yeah where no one can hear you s cream no one can hear you s cream, s cream. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so i brought home this celestial date night whoa it's called they've had other ones like the date night and, and all kinds of other this types, movie but. does kind of end on a date night between ripley and the alien a little intimate and then moment. she's like gotta get rid of this dude netflix and, and shoot you with a harpoon sim. and yeah. eject you from a spacecraft uh-huh you know how it goes. I do. I do know how it goes. This should be pretty tasty. It smells yeah, I'm excited for delicious. This. You get you a whiff of that thing. Oh, get your nose in them aromatics. What's yeah. that do to I'm glad, you? First off, glad that my nose is more opened up now because yeah. I wouldn't have been able to smell this a couple oh, days ago. Oh, that's true. It'd be unfortunate if you couldn't taste awesome. it. This awesome. Dude, this is, a, this is a delight. I had a little sample of it before I left the brewery and I was like, I made a good choice. I'm a good boy. Oh, yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. It's uh, It's got that good resiny sort of piney, but it's also mm. very fruity. 
Yeah. It's like a little bitter, a little, a little dry mm-hmm. on the aftertaste, mm-hmm. which is fine by me, man. Yeah, I like it dry. I've kind of had so many like sweet, fruity IPAs yeah, and not stuff interested. this summer mm. that I'm kind of like, okay, it's kind of nice to have something that isn't a total yeah. sugar bomb. You yeah. Know? The other day, speaking of, we've talked, I think we talked last episode about how bad hemp beers Ugh, tend to be. Just, I have not had one yet that I like. There was one that the Elkmont in Knoxville made that was uh, okay. I think it was called like Big Hempin or something mm-hmm. like that. Or Hempin Ain't Easy. Okay. One of those rat puns. Was it pretty good? It was okay. Yeah. Uh, I had a Terrapin Jazz Cabbage. Jazz Cabbage. And I'll tell you this. It was very drinkable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If somebody offered me another one of those, I'd sure take it. I would not buy a six pack of it. Okay. Yeah. But... It's worth the test if you real because like the thing that you're getting from it mostly uh, others taste kind of like bong water mm-hmm. or like licking a, an ashtray. <laughs> this one you just get the smell of hemp off of it, which is a, I mean it's a pleasant smell, yeah, earthy, somewhat, yeah. yeah. But then the the taste is more of like a just a kind of resiny but refreshing IPA. Okay, so it's mainly on yeah. the nose, not yeah. so much on the palate. Yeah, terrapin is usually. I'll say historically not a brand that I usually like. Yeah. A uh, hop make, like. is okay. It's decent. Yeah. There's one that makes it's like a tropical luau or oh, something like yeah, that. Oh, yeah. That one is good. good. I, I could dig that one. I think my favorite of theirs is that, uh, I think it's just called Galaxy. It's a single hop IPA. It's just, just oh, okay. Galaxy. I don't know if I've had it. It's, it's oh, good. Actually, I think I have. I think we may have had it on this show. We may have. Yeah. We may have. We might have gotten a pull of that one. <laughs> We've pulled many. Mm-hmm. We've had so many pulls. Boy, we get pulls <laughs> left and right. <laughs> so uh, I'll have to check that one out because, yeah, I still have not found that hemp type beer that's really made me go, yeah. ooh la la. I do want to try that Lagunitas uh, oh, sparkling yeah. water with uh, CBD or whatever. Yeah, yeah. dude. Or that, not, I'm it's got THC in it. It's got actually. THC, yeah. yeah. Not for sale in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> THC love- stands for Tennessee Hates Cannabis. I know that a lot of brewers have tried to integrate THC into microbrews, and it's real tough to do to get it right. Because, mm. you know, you sit down to drink beer, you're going to probably drink a few. But if you have a few that have THC in it, you might end up getting way too high. Right. Yeah, that's true. You got to balance it out. Yeah. So, like, it's a tough one. Interesting, man. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you what's not a tough one is watching Alien from Alien. 1979. The topic of our podcast today. Yeah? Yeah. Wait, was that last part? Oh, interesting. Soundtrack just keeps going. Keeps evolving. I'm going to assume that this was the first time you've yep, ever even I heard of nev- this movie. never even heard. I was like, what, Alien? Which is, one? Is that like Alien Nation? Mm. Everyone's favorite television show from is the this 80s? A, is this a biopic about Alien Gonzalez? Oh my God, where is he now? It has to be horrifying, that poor kid. <laughs> that poor guy, yeah. Dude, Alien Nation, that was a weird show. Yeah, they drank curdled milk to get drunk. I, yeah. yeah, dude, they did. That's Mandy right. Mandy Patinkin was on it. What? That just <laughs> makes it even weirder. I know. Why is his name Mandy? I love Mandy Patinkin. Oh, he's a trap. I, I hear he's, he's awesome. uh, fucking hell to work with no on way. television. Yeah. Really? Yeah. He's, apparently, he's a real sweet guy on Broadway and stuff, but oh. on television, he kind of feels like he's above it. One of those Jekyll and Hyde creatures, huh? Yeah. But, okay. I mean, you know, he also was on Princess Bride. Oh. Right. So, you had seen this movie many a time before. Yeah, yeah, I've seen this a lot of times. Yeah, yeah and this was is it a one classic. of those that did you like it as a kid and stuff? Is it one of those that's always been on your radar, or is it something this you came is, to appreciate later? I, I came to appreciate later because this is not, I think, for kids. It's paced too slowly for kids to get into it. It's and, paced too slowly for a lot of adults to get it. Yeah, but as a kid, yeah, I was much more into Predator. Mm-hmm. It's way more action packed. Way more action packed, and you see muscle men, super cool creature, and yeah, yeah Arnold Schwarzenegger, and and yeah, a wrestler in it. So, but I, I did, I saw it a few times as a kid. Then, as a teenager, became more appreciative of it. Yeah. And now, as an adult, I, I really want Alien series to be better. Yeah, like, I, because. I got so disheartened when I was watching three because I remembered hating three and then I had heard the director's cut was better. So I turned on the director's cut and I'm watching it and I'm like, well, this makes more sense. But 
that's the only way in which it's better. It's still not a good movie. See, it's been years since yeah. I watched three. Yeah, uh, like, I've only seen Alien Revolution once. Resurrection? Or Resurrection, yeah. Yeah. I saw that once in yeah. 1998, uh, you probably. You know what? I think I've actually only seen it once as well. It was not good. I watched Aliens like... Oh yeah, Aliens Within the last great. year. Yeah, so, rewatching it, uh, I was like, man, this is fucking awesome. It's fucking yeah. phenomenal. Uh, oh my god, dude. Yeah. That's that's one of those things where it's like, if you want to make a successful part two, you get James Cameron on board. Yeah, he knows what he's doing there. And yeah. if, if you set up the ball, he's going to spike that motherfucker yeah. Top Gun style. Really did. Top Gun 2, why are they doing this? I don't know. Did you watch the preview? No. I did not watch the preview. I'm not interested. I'm, like, I'm just god, not no. going to watch I want it. That. Yeah. Uh, Quick side note: Did you watch the the final It Part Two trailer? I haven't seen that yet. I'm excited. Yeah, I am I'm excited. excited for It Part Two, and we'll definitely be doing It Part uh, One. Yeah, at the beginning of September. So yeah, dude, get ready. I'm excited about that. Yeah, man, I uh, I love Aliens. It's a very different kind of movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me just ask you up front too before we get into this: Are you an Alien or Aliens person? I prefer Alien. I do too. Yeah, I, I think do. Like, I think Aliens a better movie. Aliens is great. Oh yeah, I love it. But I think Aliens a better movie. I'll tell you what's inter- interesting though is I think that if you would go back in a time pod uh-huh. or perhaps make a wormhole and go back in time and ask a younger Ben, yeah, maybe even just from like five years ago, which yeah. I liked better, I think I would have said Aliens. Oh yeah, as a kid I would have said Aliens as well because it's it's a, there's a lot more action. Yeah, and it's I mean, easy dude, to follow as a kid. There's and I the mean, special effects are insane. The special effects are great. Everybody, Bill Paxton. yeah, Bill Paxton's ridiculous. The characters are just those bigger, bigger marine, like you know, the characters. And also, it had Kyle Reese. I was a big Terminator fan. There's Kyle Reese. There's Bill Paxton. I was a big weird science fan. Paul Reiser. Paul Reiser. I was a big fan of <laughs> Paul Reiser. <laughs> Paul Reiser, everybody. I did end up loving Mad About You and watched it because I was like, that's the new from Aliens. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you put it you put it in the other order. Yeah. There. Interesting. Mm-hmm. But you know, I think over the course of like doing this podcast and really watching movies more critically and watching it for the horror elements and stuff, especially, I've just come to realize like Alien is a almost untoppable yeah. fucking masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. Yeah. Dude, and I don't know what the deal is, but all the time whenever, you know, I meet somebody who's into horror flicks and we're talking about our favorite horror movies, I'm always like, oh, I love The Shining and yeah. Texas Chainsaw and, and all this kind of yeah. stuff. I rarely ever even mention Alien. I don't know if in my mind I didn't realize how much I love this movie until we just Maybe. watched it or if in my head I'm like, oh, it's a sci-fi movie. Yeah, that is easy. I mean, because this is the perfect melding of sci-fi and horror. Yes, it is, man. Yeah. It is. And for a lot of reasons that we'll kind of talk about as we get into our, kind of our analysis of the movie, but there's so much about sci-fi mm-hmm. and space that is utterly horrifying yeah. that if done right. Yeah. And this movie just does it fucking perfectly, man. Mm-hmm. I... uh you know, I had watched this movie, I think, the last time, probably only like two years or so ago. Okay. But it was probably one of those deals where, you know, it was on. Yeah. We were probably watching it during Halloween or something, uh-huh. and I was probably playing guitar or whatever. But that's, again, the fun thing about doing this podcast is a lot of these movies that I've seen a million times. Yeah. Yeah, they've been on a million times, but I've only watched them one or two Right. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. Whereas for this movie, it's like, this is the la- this is the first time that I really sat down and, I mean, watched this movie yeah. frame by frame since probably the first time that I watched it, you know? Which has only been within the past, I bet, 10 or 15 years. Yeah. I, I didn't watch this movie when I was a kid or anything. And I remember even the very first time I saw it just being floored. Yeah. And going through and watching it with a critical eye for this podcast, I... I totally have grown like a whole new level uh-huh. of appreciation. For <laughs> it's this amazing, movie. yeah. It is nearly flawless now what you were just saying is similar to what kate was telling us earlier that yeah. this is a movie she grew up watching and seeing oh yeah over and over and over so she hasn't really like she doesn't fully pay attention to it yeah and then when you guys were watching it recently she was actually paying attention to it and she got like legit scared scared the absolute fucking dog dick out of her yeah. dude we were sitting here watching it we were sitting on the couch i was making my notes and stuff we were having some drinks and stuff and uh we have like a coffee table you mm-hmm. know, in front of the couch and specifically the part where Dallas is crawling through the air ducts. Yeah. And the alien is suddenly like behind him. Uh-huh. And the alien kind of does jazz hands. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like sha ka 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 Little jazz hands action. Uh-huh. She thought the alien like came down or something. Like she just remembered it different than, than what it was. Right. 
I mean, she kicked that fucking coffee table. I mean, three feet ahead of us, stuff like went spilling and, and everywhere all over the floor. And that scared me. That's hilarious. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, it's one of those that it doesn't matter how many times you've seen it, the tension and the atmosphere and uh-huh. the claustrophobia of this movie yeah. is just so primal and palpable. Uh huh. You know? It's Tension's all so there, free. man. You couldn't cut it with a with a lightsaber what or maybe a flamethrower you could i don't know if you do a lot of cutting with flamethrowers but they do use flame to cut things they so do. all right which you know what you were you were asking me about this the other day you're like for a ship that's definitely being pumped full of oxygen they sure do smoke a lot they and they do. also have flamethrowers they a got lot. flamethrowers yeah it's like a pretty risky so we got, situation we gotta assume that they have figured out a way to create a a more stable environment inside this spaceship it's it's the gas is always perfectly mixed there's no worry that it's gonna just catch on fire they seem pretty carefree about yeah. it yeah man whenever dallas is crawling through those air vents and going down that ladder and stuff yeah with that open flamethrower that's not like holding a big lighter no. i mean it's like a small torch yeah it's it's always got a little flame going yeah, yeah. dude i wonder how many times he accidentally like burn, burn his hair or yeah. caught his clothes on fire because while he's going down that ladder he's yeah. pretty carefree with that thing yeah and I'm like dude you just almost caught yourself on fucking and fire Sig- sigourney weaver's it's the same in the in aliens when yeah, she's dude. running around with that flamethrower it's just like whoa watch out like yeah, there man. is an actual flame there oh it's so sick man now let's talk a little bit about the the, the production aspect oh, of yeah, this I got, movie. I got a lot to say about this. There's a there's a rich history here, man, yeah. and also too, this is one of the most well documented movies yeah. in horror history. I mean, especially considering a movie that came out in 1979. I mean, this is well before they'd be thinking, "Oh, be sure to film this. We'll put it on the special features." Right? There was no special features back no. then, but there are so many documentaries featurettes like if you go on imdb and read the trivia for this there's dude, a ton it's, of it's shit. like 30 pages long it's huge I, I watched two documentaries to prepare for this the first yeah. was giger's alien oh, which is i wanted to watch his that behind the scene footage shot by his uh assistant i believe while he was making stuff like and it's narrated by him though of course if you want to see it in english it's narrated by somebody else but okay because it's swiss i guess right yeah. wow man that's got to be really fascinating i'm sure it showed like how normal of a guy he is he's surprisingly <laughs> not that weird the thing is is if yeah. you've ever hung out with anybody from that area from like yeah. germany switzerland anywhere yeah. they just kind of act like that yeah he seems pretty normal <laughs> for yeah my girlfriend killed herself in front of this painting and i have Fuck. kept the, the the blood and the bone shards on the painting did he say that that, that, he did, did that, that happen? Yeah, yeah. What? Uh, he was dating a uh, model slash actress, and uh, she suffered from depression. She ended up killing herself at 27 and, like, shot herself in front of a particular painting Whoa. of his that disturbed her. Whoa! Yeah. So basically any of them. <laughs> <laughs> take, yeah. your, take your choice here. Yeah. Wow, which typo negative song are we talking about right now? <laughs> He, like yeah she but like he, he, he can talk about that stuff and he's just smiling and he's like happy like just like oh she was very depressed yeah nightmares are the best part of my day yeah. i am like the ultimate warrior <laughs> i am like the <laughs> ultimate warrior <laughs> dude that's so cool so it did it show like his his process of his work because yeah. I, I was fascinated yeah. to see in a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that i watched that yeah i mean it's a lot of airbrush yeah that is that's how he started he started uh making these airbrush posters of his designs yeah and s- selling those in the 70s and then basically got picked up by Alejandro Jodorowsky. Oh, yeah. Along, among other artists who actually all ended up working on Alien, but picked up by him to work on Jodorowsky's Dune. The ill-fated, yeah. legendary Dune project. Yeah, there's a documentary about it. You can watch it. You can find out. Like He spent $2 million in pre-production. Like, Jesus. He, he got in the 70s. Salvador like, Dali was going to be... Yeah, that's what I thought. Dali was involved. Dali was in it, and Orson Welles. Orson Welles would what? only do it if he could, <laughs> if he could have his personal chef on... <laughs> 
yeah. His personal shit. Yeah, and the music was gonna be Pink Floyd and Magma, but like he had dude, gone, Magma's awesome. I know, he, like it was crazy. This could have been the coolest movie ever. It could have been. Are you kidding? Uh, but it also would have pissed Dune fans off because he basically was just doing his own thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, he yeah. was free willing. But apparently, it would have been fourteen hours by his script. Holy fucking his shit! Script, like the, people said, his script was like a phone book. Good lord, man, that's crazy. But anyway, Dan O'Bannon was working on that. Yeah, okay, oh, hold on. Let, me, I, let me tell the story from the beginning because this is like just crazy. I'm going to be mentioning names and titles of movies and you're going to go, all this shit is connected? What the fuck? Yeah, dude, it's it's crazy. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know everything you're about to talk okay. about, but like the level of connectedness that this has yeah. is like Total Recall and yeah. all kinds of other stuff I had no clue about. This movie is like a cornerstone of sci-fi yeah. Hollywood. And late horror, 70s, early yeah. 80s. yeah. Yeah, so this this movie is written by Dan O'Bannon. Dan O'Bannon went to film school with John Carpenter. Badass. And worked uh, with John Carpenter on John Carpenter's movie, Dark Star, Mm -hmm. which I talked about a little bit earlier, is a space movie uh, that definitely would help inspire other space movies in the future. And it was obviously inspired by 2001 and some other stuff. But Dan O'Bannon works with John Carpenter on Dark Star, he also worked as a computer animator on Star Wars. What? Okay. So this is like a man of many fucking talents here. <laughs> right. So, yeah. He thought he, his, he was kind of interested in going into animation and effects. And he got hired after doing Dark Star and Star Wars. He got hired by Yodorowsky to do effects for, for Dune. Wow. So, he wasn't writing on Dune. When that fell through, though, he was basically homeless and jobless and penniless. And he called up Ron Chassette, a friend of his, and said, can I crash on your couch? So he's crashing on Ron Chassette's couch and they start talking about a movie idea that Dan O'Bannon had had talked to him about before that was about gremlins uh, (laughs) trying to take down a B-17 bomber. Wow. And is that the seed of what would become Gremlins? It has to have some effect because because Joe Dante was working with Roger Corman and these guys all end They're up working with, with Roger, Roger Corman, Corman yeah, yeah. before they end up at Fox or not Fox. Uh, yeah. Brandywine. Brandywine. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of wonder. It's like, was this just, you know, water cooler talk and somebody. Somebody else was like, oh, that's. Oh, yeah. I can cool work with that. Cool yeah. That's Grimlins. funny, man. Anyway, they come up with this story idea. Dan O'Bannon sits down and, and writes it. And then they start shopping it around and they get it to Brandywine. And um, the guys at Brandywine decide that they want to do some rewrites on it. So they do eight different rewrites of the script. Was there anything left at that point? Well, no, they didn't. They didn't change a ton they added to the dialogue but they added the android storyline yeah the, the, the character yeah. ash as a robot yeah was not in there originally not in there at all which yeah. i'm so glad that that got added in yeah i mean there, there's a lot of points where this movie could have got bad and really dumb oh in, yeah in the whole process sure. and we'll this talk about that easily, too, yeah that was the thing that dan o'bannon was really worried about because yeah. there were some uh directors they were going for that he he was just like no like They'll just end up being a B movie, like shitty looking movie, and that's not what we're going for. Yeah, well, because up to this point too, you got to think most like sci-fi stuff was still in that realm of like Buck Rogers and right cheesy yeah. Roger Corman, you yeah, know, creature other, from outer space, yeah, no, uh, uh, two thousand one Space Odyssey and THS, THX THX eleven thirty seven yeah. had had basically changed that, and Dark Star had kind of changed that. Dark Star was more of a humorous take, but it. It looked really good. Like it looked way less campy, the, aside from the fact that the creature is a spray painted beach ball. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that that was a uh, David Geiler and Walter Hill who were doing these rewrites, and it, it pissed off Ron Chusset and uh, Dan O'Bannon a good bit. Mm. I, I should mention that David Geiler and Walter Hill would go on to executive produce Tales from the Crypt, um, which was a pretty big quick awesome, deal. Yeah. yeah. Ron Chassette, though, <laughs> there's this quote I had to write down. He he said this about them, and it's a real tortured way of saying 
that they they fucked up the script. <laughs> he said they weren't good at making it better, or in fact, at not making it even worse. Ooh, that's a weird way to say Ooh, that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, they introduced the Ash character, which was something that Chassette really liked. He thought it was it added to the story. It so, does, for sure. And it does, yeah. And despite the fact, though, that the final shooting script was almost completely written by Hill and, and Guiler, Dan O'Bannon still was awarded solo credit by the WGA, which I mm. assume was probably a concession by Guiler and, and Hill. So Dan O'Bannon, while he was working on Yodorowsky's Dune, met this... H.R. Giger fella and took some of his work and when he was working with Ridley Scott for designs he was like well I got this stuff and Ridley Scott starts looking at it and he's yeah. like we have to have this guy. Well that's something that I was unaware of is that they had worked with some other guy for the art direction and yeah. they said they loved his designs for like ships and costumes and yeah, stuff. Yeah they just but, didn't but, end up using it. Yeah. yeah. And it's like when it com- came time for like the actual alien design right. in one of the documentaries I watched they, they showed some of the sketches and it was like it looked like it was made of feet. It looked like it was made of McRibs. Like right. I couldn't tell what it was. It looked right. bad whatever it was. And you just go oh my god like they almost made this instead of the you know again the xenomorph which is just mm. unbelievably perfect so really scott saw this guy's work and was like this is it this is yeah. the thing some other inspiration that dan o'bannon took came from the thing from outer space or what what is it the the thing that the thing is based on oh yeah 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 so he was inspired by the thing to make this movie that makes it possible for the thing to become a movie. Yeah, John Carpenter's the thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's funny. So they're all, yeah, they're all like, it's just, it's all mixed up together here. And another inspiration for Ridley Scott was Dan O'Bannon convinced him to watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre with him. Right, yeah. And so Ridley Scott was just like, oh my gosh, like this, I want this this in the space movie. And yeah. terror and these people yeah. are being hunted down one yeah. by one and stuff. Yeah, he kind of liked that that count, cat and mouse uh-huh. claustrophobic kind of mm-hmm. aspect of it, which definitely creeps into this movie very heavily. Like it's not on the nose. I mean, obviously you couldn't get much more different than a hot, arid Texas landscape yeah. versus fucking space. Uh, yeah. But there's a similar thread through those movies for sure. The thing about Texas Chainsaw Massacre is they're out in the middle of nowhere and they have nowhere to run to. Yeah. It's, same uh, with that's space. That's the same. Yeah. That's the same thing, man. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So Dan O'Bannon, I mean, he he's he's gone on after that. to uh, He wrote a couple of the segments of Heavy Metal. He also co-wrote Life Force, Toby Hooper, oh, yeah. Space Vampire weird, movie. Weird movie. That's yeah. really strange. Fucking Return of the Living Dead. He wrote and directed Return of the Living Dead, and he also co-wrote Total Recall with Ron Chassette. Right, yeah. He, he had the idea for Total Recall. Yeah, back when they were working on Alien. Yeah. yeah. Which, of course, is based on a short story and stuff. Right, it was based on the Philip Dick short story. He had already bought the rights to it. Yeah. But I had no idea that those two movies were basically being written by this guy and the other guy who was living on his couch at the time because yeah. he was broke as a joke. And like that's, that's so crazy. It is really and truly how lots and lots of great movies get made. So it's like it irks me when people give up because right. the, there are people who have enough stick to to make sure that Hell Comes to Frogtown gets made and that <laughs> they lovingly create these weird mutant frog creatures right. that look too good for this stupid movie. And you look at it on paper and you're like, it's a terrible idea, but they had tenacity and got it done. Yeah, they just got it done. Meanwhile, there's tons of people with great ideas that lack the fucking yeah. tenacity to make it happen. They hit one stopping block yeah. and it's like, I guess this isn't gonna work. Yeah, I gotta sleep on my buddy's couch. I guess I need to just give up and take that office job or whatever. Yeah, dude. I get messages all the time from people being like, oh, I, I put up these videos on my YouTube channel and I only got like 200 views so I guess I'm, I'm just not gonna do it anymore. And I'm like, dude, you're not even getting started. Well, yeah, you did that. You had to go through that. We have, we're going through that currently. Where, yeah, exactly. like, you know, you don't you put up a video, it gets only a few views. Okay, we'll just keep trying, find that right formula, figure it out. Well, the difference is, is when I started putting up videos, it wasn't so I could get views. It was because, right. well, I, I would be doing this anyway, teaching people. I'll Might as well record it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, when we started this podcast, it was just, just so to talk. we could yeah. hang out, you know, yeah. just have an excuse to hang out and shit. Yeah. You know, so I so think that's follow, a big difference yeah, too. Follow that sort of stuff. Follow the stuff that you love. 
it eventually will get you there. I'm telling you, like, because, like, these guys, I mean, they were still young and they had gone to USC film school. They had a leg in the door. If you go to USC film school, you're already meeting the people you need to be meeting. It doesn't hurt. But, I mean, there are tons of other stories that we've talked about of other movies where it's just people who they didn't have anything before this one thing finally resonated with people. Yeah. I'll tell you the thing about Dan O'Bannon that really surprised me because up to now, in my head, he was just, you know, I actually didn't even put it together that the same guy that wrote Alien also wrote Return of the Living Dead, yeah. like the most punk rock, awesome uh-huh. zombie movie ever. And then you see the guy, mm-hmm. he could not look any different than what I was imagining. Like <laughs> yeah. every interview that I saw with the guy, he has like suspenders and a bow tie mm-hmm. and just this neatly parted hair and glasses yeah. and a neatly trimmed beard. Just stuff. a nerd. He, dude, he looks like somebody who would be like an extra in that town in Jaws. Yeah. Like somebody who lives <laughs> up in Nantucket Amity, or something, yeah. you know, uh-huh. he just looks like such a normal <laughs> Northeast dude. It's crazy. Super well-spoken, too. Yeah. Extremely, extremely intelligent, you can yeah. tell. Yeah, I, I saw one interview where he's like, yeah, we did Dark Star, and that's when I figured out that doing comedy is sort of difficult because everyone objectively finds certain things funny and other things not. So I became a little disheartened whenever. <laughs> and it's just like, dude, you are analytical as fuck. Yeah. How did you make... <laughs> Return of the Living Dead. Exactly. How, How did you let go of that analytical mind enough to just be like, but it can also be just be fun. Maybe she takes her clothes off in a graveyard. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> what a super, super cool guy, man. And and really, Scott, at this time, I think it's this is like his second one, movie. One movie. Yeah, yeah. This is his Woo. second movie after the Duelist Switch. Uh, did well in the independent circuit and with critics but it wasn't like a widespread hit yeah nowadays they would say it was the best sophomore effort since creed's human clay <laughs> <laughs> wait wait sorry i meant to say van halen too oh right right yeah, right yeah. i didn't mean okay. creed human clay that, creed, one, human clay, that was yeah. not very good yeah yeah <laughs> But Ridley Scott, man, he brought so fucking much to this movie. This movie is Mm -hmm. just incredibly well shot. Everything keeps you in that claustrophobic, like the walls are closing in kind of mindset. He shoots everything beautifully. Everything is lit beautifully. I could go on for another hour about why this movie is so fucking gorgeous man well we we have to talk about some choices that he made that really make the movie and the first one is that he insisted on creating the ship as an entire set one closed set that's madness and insisted that everything on the ship every button every lever every knob do something that blew my mind (laughs) Yeah. That absolutely blew my mind. I watched the um what's the what's the alien documentary that I watched? What the was Alien Legacy from alien nineteen ninety nine. There yeah. you go. It was like an hour and a half. It's on yeah, YouTube. It's, good. it's, it's really fantastic. Good. It's really cool. And it's so cool too, because you're seeing all these like all the dudes that, that worked on this movie. Uh-huh. Like, it's like twenty years later at that point. Yeah. And they're so giddy and you can tell they're so like, I can't believe we made this movie. It's so yeah. cool. Like they're so cute about it. Dude. Yeah, even like, you know, uh HR Giger, he's like um he says something like basically like some people only know me because of this movie. And, and like, you would expect some artists to be like, that sucks. And he's like, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, totally, <laughs> man. Because this movie's good. This movie is so metal. <laughs> yeah. It's so metal, man. <laughs> but yeah, in that documentary, they were showing how everything on there was functional. And that blows my mind because I'm so used to the world of like, you know, the, the Star War. Where yeah. There's all these flashing Christmas lights all over right, everything. Right, but they, and they don't, don't do necessarily dig. do anything. Yeah. Whenever you see somebody in this movie push a button and a door opens, it's because there's a switch yeah. attached to you it. You had to push that, that button for that, that door to door. open. Yeah. Dude, it's crazy. So that sequence when she's putting in like the, the yeah. self-destruct sequence, that's all stuff she had to know. Like, I have to do this, 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 this to oh, make man. these things open. Like It's so bitching. Yeah. It's so bitching, dude. Yeah, and they show the, that documentary, they also show some of the props and yeah, like some of them didn't even get used yeah stuff that didn't even get used like there was a a, a a toolbox yeah that had like a light in it that still worked and like a same drill battery from stuff. 1970s a, a drill that still worked like but it's like it's so like a, detailed a powered toolbox so you yeah. have all these like almost dremel tool like things that attach with a wire to, to a battery toolbox. in the toolbox yeah and they they made this shit yeah 
it actually works. Uh-huh. Mind blowing. They yeah. made that cat carrier. Like they did all this stuff for real. Ridley Scott wanted to, he loved the design elements of 2001 a Space Odyssey, but he loved the lived in feel of yeah. Star Wars where when you're on the Millennium Falcon it's like, well yeah, he the Chewbacca and Han Solo live there. It looks like somebody's obviously. been smoking Marlboro Reds in there for right. several years. Yeah. yeah. And so like he wanted it to have that feel to it while still also having the cool aesthetics that you might get from a, a Kubrick movie and yeah. fucking nailed it. Oh my god, absolutely so. Absolutely so. And that that aesthetic, that kind of you know, retro future or like very yeah. utilitarian mm-hmm. kind of look where it's like, you know, when you think about UFOs, they're always streamlined and aerodynamic. But yeah. whenever you see these these ships in, you know, the Star War and this and stuff, they're these big blocky wedge shaped things. They're entirely right. utilitarian. And I love that look. Yeah. So much. I want the future to be more blocky yeah. and grimy and shit. It is all it is it is weird to me when spaceships are aerodynamic because if they're traveling light years, they're using some other process than just think, yeah. moving forward. So aerodynamics aren't really an not really issue. coming into play. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a pretty solid point when you look at it that way. But there's so many other things that they tied into the design aesthetic in here that I hadn't really noticed that much until this time around but even inside of like the living quarters parts of the of the Uh ship and stuff like not the utility lines and things but like the parts where they're you know having dinner and shit like that in the cabin there's a lot of designs on the wall that are almost like mayan or aztec yeah that's what he was going for yeah that's what really scott wanted that sort of aztec look which then I comes back later in Alien versus Predator when they make that part of like oh yeah the, shit that's right the history of this alien predator thing yeah oh um, dang I, I it's did really interesting about that yeah and there's other like Egyptian motifs and all kinds yeah. of stuff floating around it's kind of like you get this big mixing of every great culture ever right and even like on their jackets and stuff there's these weird like it's like a twisted union jack symbol yeah there's and stuff. a twisted american flag and a twisted union jack yeah like and like the wayland yutani symbol like the symbol of the company is like yeah. these egyptian wings uh-huh you know like you see on old hieroglyphics and stuff dude the yeah. amount of detail is crazy they they went all in on set design yeah. and making sure that they create because like what they had with the story at its heart is a proto slasher movie. The movie isn't about space. It's not about space travel. They're not talking in depth about those things. They're just people doing a job that happens to be in space. Space is the place. And then they get stalked by this creature and killed. And it's picking them off one by one. One by one. That's yeah, like so, a slasher. So yeah. slashery when you look at it that way, isn't it? Yeah. So. The real simplicity of that makes then all this effort in set design make you think like, why that? Why is it like this? Like when they find the space jockey, you're like, what is that what the gigantic fuck is that thing? thing, man? Yeah. Oh, it's so sick. And no explanation ever yeah. comes because it's not a sci-fi movie in that way. Because a lot of sci-fi movies get big into exposition to build this world. Yeah. And this one just goes, no, no, no. This is the world. Look at it. It's fucking crazy. You're going to be thinking about it forever. But we're not going to explain it to you at all. Yeah, because essentially it's just about some space truckers that yeah. end up in a weird situation. Which is why people don't like Prometheus. Because Prometheus does the opposite. It's like, okay, well, let's go back and explain all that stuff. Yeah. And it's like, well, I don't need the explanation. I, I want dude, the terror of that fucking alien of not stalking knowing. you. Yeah. And, dude, that's one of those things. Like, I have it written in my notes. Like, somewhere in my notes, I just wrote, like, Ridley Scott has lost his way. Because <laughs> <laughs> even in that, that that alien documentary I was talking about watching, that, that they filmed 20 years after the making of this. Yeah. You know, Ridley Scott is talking about all kinds of stuff where he's talking about the design of the of the xenomorph and he's like, Yeah, we just we made this choice to make it not have eyes. Yeah. You know, for it just to have this smooth bulbous face and he's like, Maybe it just entirely works off of sound or smell or whatever. He's like, But you know what? We ended up in a place where we didn't have to describe it and I think that made it better. Yeah. He's like, Sometimes it's better not knowing the details. And I'm like, Then why did you go back and try to explain yeah. all the details? And a lot fucking of idiot. interviews 
pre Prometheus, he would talk about like just like I didn't think about that because there's what? no reason to. He's like, right, and it's it so is much better. more interesting if you don't go into that depth. Yes, dude. I mean, I get like you could easily just I don't know if you would Halloween 2018 it entirely and cut even aliens out, but you could make a sequel to Alien. That maintained the ambiguity ambiguity yeah. of it that could also give us more without telling it. Like you you can give more exposition somewhat without actually just telling it. You can just show us more. They can go to the planet where the aliens come from or whatever. Like any of those things. Right. I mean, two does the same beautiful thing where it's like they don't really get in depth about no. any of it. Then three just is a uh, mishmash of ideas. But then they do start... They start with, like, the Ripley alien clone and... Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. He gets starts getting weird. Yeah, real wacky. Then they come back with Prometheus, just like, we're going to tell you why all this stuff, basically. Yeah. Prometheus, dude, and, and I will talk about it more as I go on. That and... Um, fuck covenant covenant i haven't seen yet it it, it all sucks so bad I'll, and i'll talk i'm sure as we go along here about why they suck because they're just the opposite of everything that was done right in this movie oh yeah you know i mean there's even a part in that documentary where ridley scott was talking about how part of the glory of jaws uh-huh. which obviously jaws is a huge influence on this movie yes i mean it was kind yeah, of shopped around that as is jaws what, in space it was shopped around as a few things haunted house in space jaws in space and space truckers yeah i mean that's yeah. that's it but, you know, he was talking about how part of why Jaws was so effective is because the shark broke and they couldn't show it much. Yeah. It's like when you don't know what's killing these people, you, when you don't know where it is. Yeah, and you don't see it. Yeah. But you you get those the moment when you see it, see it, and it's like frightening as fuck because you haven't been seeing it the whole time. Yeah, and Ridley Scott himself was like, those kinds of limitations make you more creative when yeah. you can't just show it all the time. Yeah. And then, again, what does he do when he makes Prometheus and Covenant? Yeah. Shows the fucking alien for like 30 or 40 minutes in the movie. Goes back Dude. to Sinbad. He's not riding the bus anymore. Oh my, yeah, that's it, Disconnected. right? That is yeah. the thing, man. The xenomorph in this movie is in here for four minutes total. Yeah. It is a two-hour movie. There are four minutes of Alien on and screen. And when it's hidden on the escape pod, I really legit... You can't see it. You don't see it. And then suddenly it's like, oh, fuck, it's right there, right in our face. I know, man. Yeah. And that's what makes it so cool is... You never know where it is. You're yeah. never... I mean, really, you know, if you're watching this in 1979 before everybody knew what a xenomorph looked like and you yeah. had action figures and shit like this, you didn't even know what was attacking him. Right. You don't even know the form of the thing. Yeah. Because there's never... I mean, other than the very end when it gets ejected, there's not really any full body shots of no. the thing. There's just like the terrifying face shots, uh-huh. little double jaw thing. You yeah. see a claw and a tail. Like, you don't know where it is. You don't know what it is. Right. And that makes it so terrifying. And then, like I said, then he just completely contradicts himself and shows you the aliens all over the place. There's parts in Covenant where, like, you're seeing, like, alien vision, where you're, like, you're seeing through the alien's eyes, I guess. Yeah. Just fucking stupid, dude. I I think all of that would have been better to just be comic books. Like, comic books are where you can explore, like... The, the Alien Predator comics by Dark Horse right. were sick. Yeah, and uh, the Predator comics give you so much more background about like the the race as a whole yeah, and, and like and their stuff. culture and stuff. Yeah. yeah, those are real interesting. But when you sit down to watch a movie, you expect certain things, and you just can't make your alien exposition movies and expect them also to be appreciated as good movies because they're not gonna be. They're just gonna be going exactly against everything good about alien as a yeah. franchise yeah totally man are you a big ridley scott fan i like him yeah. yeah yeah i mean uh you know he's done a lot of movies that uh more recently that i i don't really care for but yeah i've not really seen a lot of his more recent stuff but yeah dude to me he's one of those guys that will always be on my like hall of fame yeah winner's circle you know mount rushmore list because the holy trinity of movies that he made okay back in the day man fucking alien obviously uh-huh. legend yes 
which is just, dude, Legend is so sick. One of the most visually delightful movies ever. And of course, motherfucking Blade Runner. Yeah, R.I.P. Rutger Howard. Yeah, dude, I just heard the news today, man. Mm-hmm. We just lost Rutger today. That fucking sucks. Tears and rain, man. Now, oh. I thought you were, of course, going to say the real Holy Trinity, which is, of course, Thelma and Louise. Uh, matchstick man in American Gangster. <laughs> he did Matchstick Man. I saw yeah. that in theaters. I forgot about that movie. Man. I thought it was okay. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I haven't really thought about it in about 20 years. He did Gladiator, which is uh, still good. Yeah. I still right. enjoy that movie. I think it's a pretty cool movie. Yeah. I enjoy it. But man, Blade Runner, it's like between, between Blade that, Runner, yeah. It, dude, yeah. One of the best of all time. Yeah. He made, with I think within a decade, it's like he made one of the greatest fantasy movies ever. Yeah. He made one of the greatest sci-fi movies ever yeah. and one of the greatest horror movies yep. ever. I mean, the odds of that are just insane. He was batting yeah. a thousand there for a little he while. He really was. He was and doing great. all those movies are so visually captivating and unique. And it's cool, too, just to see that even though Blade Runner also has kind of that retro future kind of aesthetic, it doesn't look like Alien. No. He's not a, a one-note kind of guy he's not a one trick pony right he can conjure up all kinds of different aesthetics to suit the vision of whatever movie it is that he's working with yeah really amazing really really talented great director yeah. one of the things about this movie that we've got to talk about what it is is that cast they got some people in this there that you may are have heard of. some real human beings in this there's movie. a tom skirt tom skirt yeah skirt i barely know it <laughs> <laughs> Tom Skerritt, who you'll recognize as that fatherly presence in tons of stuff. Yeah, dude. He's really just got that great tone. He also plays some assholes. He does. Yeah, because, you know, a guy who has that friendly, welcoming tone suddenly being a bad guy. It happens sometimes. It happens sometimes, mm-hmm. man. This movie revealed to me that he should always have a beard. He's kind of yeah. got that shitty face. <laughs> you know what I mean? He got a case he of the has shitty, that shitty face. face, dude. Like it's just a rough case of the yeah. shitty face. In a lot of movies, he do, like has just a mustache. Yeah, and there's something about his his He's mouth and chin area. You don't like it, it? It does not work for me, man. So huh. I would advise him as uh, as Dracula once advised Canoe Reeves. Uh huh. Grow a beard. Grow a beard. <laughs> so Tom Scared is awesome. This he had already been kind of a star for a while. Yeah, he'd been doing cast. some stuff. He'd already had some some things under his belt. In fact, the entire cast, aside from Sigourney Weaver, uh, you could say that about them. And that was sp- specifically because Ridley Scott knew that this was an effects and set heavy movie and he did not want to be spending a lot of time working with the actors he can't be holding no amateur's hands through right. this entire process so they had to be they had to know their shit and yeah. be able to just show up and work when they were ready because they were like that uh the the space jockey that thing was huge it's like 30 feet tall yeah. it's gigantic gigantic yeah so they're moving these sets and building shit as they're going and stuff and he he needed them to be ready to go as yeah he doesn't need a, people on stage you know being like what's my inspiration yeah. ridley right but Just they did the work done take a risk on sigourney weaver who had only been in in two films up to that point and really? not been in a starring role at all she wow. was in a non-speaking role in annie hall and then another smaller movie and with a small role uh and then this she's the star <laughs> like, wow i didn't know that that's how quick her meteoric rise to yeah. fame was it's pretty interesting and there's only seven people in this movie not right. counting the xenomorph and, and jonesy right. obviously and the voice of mother oh yeah the voice yeah. of mother that's right um we got a bilbo baggins in here that's right he's up to some tricks he's real tricksy in this movie he is a tricksy hobbit oh my god dude mm. yeah he is awesome he is so yeah, he's great like cold and and analytical mm-hmm and there's a couple times, like the first couple times I watched this movie, I totally forgot that he was a robot in it. So whenever there's that turn where it's right. just like, wait, there's robots in this world? <laughs> right. They're fucking robots? Robots. Because nobody up to this point had talked about like, boy, they just should have manned this thing with robots. Am I right? Uh-huh. You don't even suspect that there would be humanoid robots. Right. Because they don't spend any time on exposition. They're just like, this is the world, but yeah. that's not the story I'm telling you. And it's so clever, yeah. too, that they put him as the science officer. Yeah. Because he is very cold and analytical and is more interested in this alien right. creature than everybody else but you just go well it's because he's a science guy yeah that's he's a fucking yeah, that's, nerd that's a trope of scientists yeah that they might be bad with people or cold or more yeah. blunt not not 
quite as capable in social situations. So yeah, you don't suspect that he's an android. But then it, it turns out that you know, and again, that's one of those things that was added to the original script. Yeah. It turns out that he's this robot, and you find out, too, that he's just kind of this symbol of, of like, corporate greed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not caring. Like, the crew is expendable. Whatever. Just bring the organism back, which I think adds a really cool kind of side message. It does. To this movie. And, and that plays out in Aliens. Yeah, which is yeah. even more about, like, they don't care. Just grind them up, whatever. Uh-huh. Get the organisms so we can weaponize them. Yeah, it's an anti-corporate message. Hey, two weeks in a row. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, right? I was thinking about that. We've also got a Harry Dean Stanton. Harry Dean Stanton, who you'll recognize from a million things. Um, and I'm, we'll be covering other stuff with him in the future. He's I don't been know. in a ton I don't think we've done movies. anything. He died recently, uh, a yeah, couple did, years ago. Man. John Hurt, who also died also recently. Also died recently, yeah. Ollivander himself, a.k.a. the War Doctor. Uh-huh. And he's he's great in this, man. He yeah. doesn't make it terribly far. No, he doesn't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he John Hurt, like, how, how old is he in this? Because I could guess 70. Dude, that's the thing that confuses me about both him and Harry Dean Stanton. Yeah. Like, Harry Dean Stanton was not old when this was no, made. but he looks like it. He already looked extremely yeah. old. Like, he <laughs> he in his, like, trucker hat and his puffy jacket yeah. looked like the guy that was selling me comic books at, like, every flea market I ever went yep. to when I was a kid. <laughs> like, they all that were just guy. Harry Dean Stanton yeah. clones. Uh-huh. <laughs> And John Hurt always just kind of looked old, too. Yeah, always. We also got Yafet Kodo. Yeah. Who um, was also in Running Man. But oh, yeah, that's right. He was, he's wasn't in, he? He's in some horror movies I might cover. He's for great sure. in this, He's great dude. in this, yeah. He, him and Harry Dean Stanton's interactions, I love. They're like this little two-man there's a, team. There's a lot with like overlapping sort of funny dialogue. Yeah, that it's, it's like Robert Altman-esque, but also like it seems maybe some of it was just improvised a little well i'll tell you what's so good about it man is that and again this this goes right into part of why prometheus sucked uh and this was amazing what i really picked up on this time through the movie this is something kate and i were talking about because when you watch these people interacting on screen like none of them are really big stereotypical or uh archetypal characters of like the jocks the bully the know-it-all like they're just kind of people they're just people but yeah. at the same time, you got to remember when you're watching this movie, and again, I really noticed it this time, they're on their journey home. Yeah. They've already been working together and they're living. tired as fuck. Yeah, and tired of each other. Yeah. That scene where Harry Dean Stanton and Yafet Koto are in that room and they're like blasting Ripley with all the steam and stuff. Yeah. And she's like, why don't you just fuck off? Yeah. And like, what was that? And she's like, I'll be in the, uh-huh. in the lobby or whatever it is. Yeah. I'll be in the cockpit. I think she says, I got to deal with you forever. Yeah. It's yeah. like you can tell that they are already kind yeah. of tired of each other's shit. You yeah. know, they've gone out, they've, they've towed this big mining vessel back. We don't even know how long they've been out. They might have been out for years. I mean, they've been in hypersleep. I love so. that. I love how, like, it, it gives you some sci-fi info where it's like, this is the name of the ship and what it's carrying and stuff, and it's like, none of that's important. It's no. just part of the sci-fi trope. But they don't fall into the sci-fi trope hole of fucking over explaining every yeah. single detail. But I I love just how they interact with each other. I mean, yeah. they really seem like they are like it really reminds me of like every time you go out and do like a little, you know, tour run or whatever, even maybe it's just a long vacation with your friends or whatever and it starts yeah. off and everybody's fun, everybody's having a good time and then after a week or two when you're just like, like, oh my oh, god, yeah, if done. that guy fucking burps one more time, yeah. I'm going to lose my shit. Like, you get tired of people, whether you like them or not. It happens no matter what. Yeah. And these people on this on this crew seem like they're professionals, and they're like, we're gonna we're gonna work through this stuff together. Yeah. But you can tell they're they're tired. They want to go home. Right. And also we have Veronica Cartwright, who plays the mom from Flight of the Navigator. Lember. Oh yeah, she's also <laughs> uh, Spender's mom in X Files. She's mom's a lot, I guess. She that lady's still working. She just started wow, uh, really? a role on General Hospital hmm. recently. It's crazy. Her and um, uh, Ripley. Oh, fuck, her name's not Ripley. Sigourney, Sigourney Weaver. Weaver. Thank yeah. you. Were the youngest ones on set. Yeah. And they were, I think, both like 29 or 30 yeah, or yeah. something like that. They were the youngest ones. Like, the whole movie is kind of a lot of older people. Yeah. And the casting... Okay, so this is interesting. While writing it, Dan O'Bannon tried to specifically keep the characters a little, like, open and vague and loose mm. to give actors room to make the character. Okay. 
And he also didn't assign any gender to them. Hmm. Well, and that makes sense, too. When you think about it, they're all referred to by their last names. Yep. There's not Bill or Patty. Yeah. You know? They really just wanted them to be normal people. And so, also, that opened the door for Ridley Scott to be like, I could make some of these characters female. Yeah. And he decided to make his protagonist female. Which I wonder why it is that they didn't make that hard decision while writing the script to be like, this is the male character. This is a female character. I wonder why it is that they were like, we don't need to be the ones to pull the trigger on this. Were were they just like, it'll be easier to get sold? Yeah. If... You know, we let whoever's making the movie decide who's a man and a woman and who's black and whatever. Yeah, you do have to remember what I was saying, that Dan O'Bannon was penniless and living on his friend's couch in yeah. L.A. So, like... Please buy this movie. Yeah, you make this any, you put purchasable. Anybody, make one of them a dog. I don't care. I'll, I'll make that... <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and make that challenge to anybody out there who writes scripts. Everybody starts out with, I'm going to make my mark on the world. Mm-hmm. Here's what I challenge you to do. Make your mark on a type of movie. Write the movie the way that people want to see it. You want to make an alien movie? Watch good alien movies and try to duplicate their success. Hmm. This is a, a writing challenge that everybody has to get past to get over the idea that you're going to make something no one's ever heard of. You yeah. might. You very well might. Yeah, that, it happens. It happens. But what happens more often is that you start discovering why a lot of the stories we tell over and over yeah. are similar. Right, 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 right. You know, that's so funny. That's so similar to, to something I tell my like guitar students and stuff yeah. a lot. Because I have a lot of people that come to me and they're like, I'm really struggling with songwriting. Like, I don't know where to get started. Mm-hmm. I have bits and pieces of ideas, but nothing that really works together. Right. And I'm like... If you're struggling with that, which, like you said, some people are naturals and will just come yeah. up with the most off-the-wall crazy shit ever. Yeah, that's just in their head. Yeah. And if you're like that, good for you. Yeah. Uh, the world needs your gift. Be sure to share it. Have tenacity. Right. Get it out. Yeah. You know? But for the rest of us, you know, normal folks like myself, uh-huh. you know, I, I tell people, it's like, rewrite a song that works. Yeah. Take a look at, like, Teen Spirit yes. by Nirvana. And yeah. Be like, Why okay, does that work? Yeah. And... Write it down on paper. Write uh-huh. down, okay, clean guitar riff, ripping loud version of that same guitar yeah. riff. Then it gets quiet. Then there's singing. Then it gets a little louder. Yeah. Write that song. I'm not saying write those same chords. Don't write it in the same key. But Don't write try it in the same to tempo. write that song, the, the spirit of that song yeah. that hit the tropes of that song. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's one of those things, man, whenever people are doing any kind of artistic pursuit, writing a, writing a story, writing a movie, right. writing a song or whatever... We feel like there should be this divine intervention where the fucking muses bestow you with this idea and there's a Mother, golden ray of yeah. light yeah, mm-hmm. coming from the sky. Yeah. And dude, it's like, meanwhile, if you're an architect, do you know what you do? You study fucking blueprints. Yeah. You look at what made this building work. What made this structurally secure? And for some reason, if you're in an uh, artistic field, you feel like that's not on the table for you. But it's absolutely on the table. If you're smart, it's on the table yeah. for you, man. Yeah. It's... Look at what works. Dan Harmon gives this advice to writers a lot. Write the shitty version of the movie. <laughs> like, like if that, you have yeah. a movie idea and you're struggling to get it down, write the shitty version of the movie. Mm-hmm. And then you can go back and look at your draft and improve the shit yeah. you can go it's like what sketching is right Sketch. but you've now but you've got a draft because yep. you can't do shit until you've got a draft yep so much of writing is just fucking writing just do it because so many writers put off the actual moment mm. of of sitting down and writing and the best way to get it done is to be like all right i want to make uh i don't know space werewolves I want to make space werewolves. Uh, what do werewolf movies have? They got transition scenes. They got uh, people who don't know what's going on at first. Uh, they just got to have a full moon. You got to include all these things. You got to have reasons for why these things work. And what's the best way to start writing the dialogue? Stupid dialogue. Yeah, start shitty. Just start shitty. Wow. You can improve it. You can go back and you can cut dialogue. You can say like, we don't need anyone to say anything in this moment. We just need the action. You can go back and improve the dialogue, but you've got something to work off of. Well, because look at it this way. If you can identify shitty, that means you know what should be better. Yes. 
Exactly. And instead of just starting with, yeah. oh, I have to start with the best idea. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes just start with the shitty one and then be like, uh, you know, it'd be better. Yeah. This sucks because this reason. Yeah. Then you do the right thing. Start with wagon wheel. See where it gets you. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please not wagon wheel. <laughs> you know, going back to the casting of this movie, though, I, I, I can't. I can't complain about it even one no. iota. Everybody does such an amazing job. And one of the things that's cool about it, too, like, you know, of course, nowadays, this movie is, which this is frightening to me, this movie is 40 years 40 old. 40 years old. Which also means this movie is only years. five years older than me, which freaks me out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but whenever you're watching this movie, you know, nowadays we know Ripley is the badass of Alien. Yeah. It's all about Ripley. The movie's not really all about Ripley. It's not clear until everyone else is dead that it must be all about her. Yeah. Or, like, well, the first hour or so of the movie, you assume Dallas is the main character because he's... Yes, he's the a, one making the decisions. He's a man and he's right. making decisions and stuff. Like, Ripley is there and she's like... She's really keeping shit in its place. Like, whenever right. everybody's freaking out about the facehugger and stuff, and she's like, no, you go to quarantine. You can't yeah. come on the ship. Like, she's handling shit, and I even like to, like, she kind of, like, gets pretty snippy at some of them a little bit when they're all debating about what to do to flush the alien out. Like, yeah. she's a hard ass with them, but she is by no means the main character. Like, we're not following her around the right. ship or anything we're like that. We're seeing everybody's perspective. Yeah. It's only whenever, well, she ends up being one of the last ones. Yeah. Which I forgot that it was her, Lambert, and Yafet Kodo were the last three alive. Yeah, the two women and the black guy. Yeah, it's like that's the opposite of, I think, every yeah. horror movie. And Lambert, uh, who... Uh, well, every who, horror trope, anyway. Right. That's not true. Lambert, who Ridley Scott, you know, hey, he kind of had in his mind that this was her first trip out. And so that, that's that why deal? she's... That's why she's always looking off pensively and seeming like, you it's know... kind of panicky. Panicky about everything. Huh. Uh, so, like, yeah, the idea that... The the newbie survives long. The the black guy, though we've talked about that trope not actually being accurate. It's only about fifty percent of the time, mm -hmm. which is too often that the black guy dies first. Well, sure, still doesn't happen all the time. And then another woman who's our final girl. But any one of them could be the final person at that point. Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've, Look at the draw. But she is the one we know the most about at this point because we see Yafet Koto. Uh, a good bit. Parker. That's Parker. the name. Parker. Yeah, we see Parker a good bit with Harry Dean Stanton, but they're always just joking around. Yeah, we don't yuck, really yuck, get yuck. much about him. He just seems like, you know, they seem like the comic relief. Um, and then, yeah, we've been seeing Lambert going through like a lot of stuff. And so she could be our final. She could be the person who is the last to survive because, you know, she she overcomes her panicky energy to you know, assert herself finally. Yeah, that would be a, a typical arc yeah. that you could see in a lot of movies. Where, But what we see instead is not much of a character arc, just we got this badass who happens to be the last survivor because she's a badass and she continues to be a fucking badass. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that I really like about this flick too, uh, for one, definitely passes the Bechdel test. Yes, it's the it's a very woman friendly movie, right? The the uh, the initial comic that creates the Bechdel test, yeah, is uh, it mentions Alien, and that spawned the whole Bechdel test thing, yeah, because they didn't go back in and rewrite the characters as female; they just kept the script they had and cast women, right? Yeah, it's a crazy idea that, that you could just write a character as a human. But you know what I like too is. In this in this future, you know, uh, space tugboat workplace environment, <laughs> space tugboat. There's like no mention of them being women or oh, women no. driver, women in the workplace. Am I right? No. There's yeah, no none special of that allowances that are given to the women. No. There's no like, oh, we need a man for this job, or you no. can't do this one, little lady. There's none of that shit. Everybody just kind of works with each other because they're all competent people on the job. Aliens introduces some of that and also in, makes her femaleness a bit of a central issue with her daughter being dead 57 years later when she's unfrozen. And right. Yeah. They kind of bring in a little bit more than maternal <laughs> but then aspect. Alien cubed. That's the one that just fucking. <laughs> just like, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, Ripley's not actually a badass. Yeah. She's like pretty weak in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't know where Fincher was going with that one, man. It's yeah, very he didn't strange. Either. That's why he didn't want his name on it. He didn't like. Really? Yeah. Is he didn't so? want his name on the, the movie at all. He didn't Damn. like the way it progressed. 
Well, I can't really blame him yeah, that much, I honestly, either. man. But, dude, I love the fact that, like I said, there's no mention, really, of who's a man and a woman, who can do what. The women aren't even really, like, made up in this movie. Like, Nobody they're both, is. They're both very yeah. pretty ladies well, and yeah, stuff. Well, yeah, but they but both have not. short hair because it's more helpful in work and yeah. easier to slip these uh, space helmets on and shit. Nah, that's true. They can't have long hair and a space helmet. And they're not waking up on their on their, their space truck and putting on lipstick and stuff. No. That's just not realistic. No, they're just doing work. They're regular people doing work. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's not like glamorous work. But at the same time, even though the characters themselves and the way that they, they treat each other and stuff isn't terribly gendered, I think that it would be a huge mistake to not mention the very, very obvious... Uh, sexual overtones oh, yeah. throughout this movie. I, I see there's reviews well, sometimes to some people that are like, yeah, sometimes people say there's like sex stuff. I don't really see it. And what? it's like, are you The crazy? alien is an, like an amalgamation of dicks put together. The, the space jockey is just in a huge phallus. <laughs> Everything is so like phallic it's or yonic. So, yes, Everything every is either. Every fucking thing. The ship itself is called Mother, like a womb. It yeah. is a womb. They wake up in these little pods, like in the heart of the ship, in yeah. the belly of the ship almost. Yes. It's extremely yonic and phallic. And again, that that's, I'm sure, all thanks to H.R. Giger. Yes, yeah, well, that's, yeah, that, that was his stuff. And I mean, the creature itself, aside from having, you know, this big black penis head. Yeah, and it shoots a little dick out of its mouth. It that, shoots a little dick out of its yeah, mouth. And, and penetrates you. And it's penetrates like, you. It's, it's obviously And impregnates sexual. you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, like, that, I mean, that's the face hugger that impregnates you. But I mean, the, like, it's that's all part of it. The xenomorph is all dick. Yeah. Well, and, and then like even the face hugger when they're doing the autopsy and it shows like the undercarriage of that thing. Yeah. I mean, it's literally made of like oysters and stuff. Yeah. It's like it's made of some of the most phallic right. food stuffs. <laughs> right. Also, face huggers extremely not kosher. No. Shellfish, oysters, chicken, Yuck-o. all these mixed meats. Not approved. I mean, aside though from just looking phallic, the the alien costume itself utilizes condoms and KY jelly. Yeah, dude, that thing like, is lubed up and ready yeah, to get up in your gut. It is sex. It's ready to get yeah. in your gut. Yeah, and it does. There's a human skull in there. Yeah, I didn't like, know about it, that. It is so detailed that like under that plasticine black exterior, there's like. A textured skull underneath that That's integrates insane. an actual human skull. Like how the fuck? And why? Like and you why? wouldn't That's have to. Thing. You, you can't see to. it on screen but at you, all. It, like it does add something to it. Knowing that it makes it so much more. And it also had like ninety different moving parts inside that thing. That's insane. Yeah, that is just nuts. But dude, you cannot deny the obvious really crazy male rape uh, yeah. uh, terror that this movie yeah. has just laced throughout it. Dude, yep. I mean, the fact that they chose one of the male crew members specifically to get face fucked yes. by this by this the, the, the face hugger thing uh-huh. and then impregnated. Yeah, and then it bursts out of his womb. And then, yeah, he gives birth. Yep. I mean, he has something... To a big dick alien. To a big dick thing, yeah. yeah it looks it's like, like a penis with teeth. It does. It's even like pale at first yeah. and stuff, dude. It's so fucking gross. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll put it this way. You know, we talk a lot of times about how movies are very allegorical and how it's like, oh, yeah. this movie's actually about Vietnam War or whatever. Right. I don't think that this movie is necessarily about uh, ab- about rape from the male perspective. I don't right. think that it's about it, No, per that's se. just one of the themes. Well, I just kind of think that all of those things are there to make you uncomfortable watching it. Right. Even just on a, a, a psychological level. Even right. if it's just kind of running in the back of your head where you're like a guy watching this and you're thinking about something face-fucking you and putting its baby inside of you. I mean, you can't not think about that because the thing is, is like, I think what's so terrifying about watching this movie as, as you know, a, a straight white dude, Yeah. getting raped isn't usually on my radar. That's yeah, not, not one of those things I think this yeah. could happen to me. Right. You know, I've never been a victim of sexual assault. Obviously, I know that sexual assault happens to men all the time. Yeah. That's one of those things we don't talk about nearly enough mm-hmm. as a society because you're supposed to tough it out and be a man or whatever. We well, don't. We don't talk general, about shit we don't enough. Take rape seriously. No, no, yeah. for anybody. You know, yeah. but for me, 
from my perspective, that's just one of those things that is not on my daily radar. Yeah, it's not something I worry about. Yeah. And then whenever I, you know, like some of my, my friends and stuff, my, my female friends have gotten pregnant and everything, and I'm watching them, their bodies are changing, their bellies are swelling. And then Check I'm thinking, out the mother episode to oh hear God, some of the dude. terrible things that happens <laughs> oh when you go pregnant. My. That's a great super fun episode. Mm-hmm. That one was great. But yeah, like the, to me, the whole thought of being impregnated and giving birth or even having a C-section, yeah. you know, it's this thing pretty much just forces a c-section out it's scary as shit it's it's disgusting and scary and it makes you as a male think about the stuff that women think about all the time dude yeah. like the utter terror of you know i mean every every woman that i know i think has been in some somewhere in the uh the spectrum yeah. of sexually assaulted in some way yeah basically every woman you yes. know has but then much less having to live with the fear that not only is there a pretty high probability of you being sexually assaulted and raped, but then also impregnated by this thing that just violated you? That's utterly terrifying. Yeah. And as, again, a straight male who's never been sexually assaulted, it's one of those things I never even think about. But this movie makes you yeah. go to those places. Which is very uncomfortable. Extremely uncomfortable, yeah. man. So I think to deny those aspects of the story is just stupid. I think it's right there on Front Street. And uh, probably one of the reasons why Ridley Scott wanted to make the protagonist female. Yeah. Where, you know, if this if this fear is associated with rape, then when she's the last one left, of course we're afraid that yeah. she's going to be invaded by this alien. And you kind of expect, because we now understand the final girl, you kind of expect her to survive. But in, <laughs> when this came out, it wasn't definite. It wasn't yeah. like one of those things where you're sure she's going to survive. And even when like the original ending was basically just her getting away in the, the escape pod. That was it. And they wanted more. They wanted more of a resolution to it. They yeah. wanted the well, alien fourth act. to die. Yeah. So they, they put the alien in, in the pod with her at that time watching it. You had to be actually worried that she might die watching it now from our perspective. It's like. Well, you know she's going to survive. Like She's the final girl. Yeah. She's, well, she's this, this the movie, survivor. Before this movie, and a lot of other movies that it influenced, yeah. you weren't really anticipating that trope. Right. Especially for a movie that's supposed to be sci-fi. Oh, man. It's just so amazing. And like you said, there's all kinds of other imagery all over the movie. I mean, the, the eggs themselves are very, yeah. very vaginal. They are, and they're filled with pig guts. Ew. Yeah. And that's the thing about this that makes it so cool, too. So much organic material. Yeah, they use a lot of a organic lot of meat material. and stuff uh-huh. went into making these things. It's gross. Oh, uh, dude. By the way, I love that like laser membrane thing that's over the eggs. Yes. Oh, that's so cool. It's dude. really cool. Apparently, they got that laser thing because in the same studio they were putting together a touring lights package for the who yeah i read that and they borrowed it from them (laughs) which is pretty badass that is pretty cool that might be the best thing the who has ever done maybe maybe so (laughs) contribute that laser to to (laughs) i'm not a big who fan of all the big classic bands i'm just kind of like i don't know roger's not that great of a singer yeah i'm a fan yeah not a huge fan but i'm a fan yeah but I just I love the way that they that they put this together by mm-hmm. having you know the males by the majority be the victim and have to go through these things that women have to worry about all the fucking time. Yeah. Which again also for a movie taking place, you know, 1979, pretty forward thinking. That, I mean that was the thing. And I've talked about this a bit where like we just assume we've progressed in women's rights and things, but I, I argue that we've definitely regressed where in the seventies people assumed, Oh, well, yeah, in the future, women will just be like men. It won't be much of a difference. Like those were the utopian ideals. Right. And today it's like you say that and 50,000 people online are going to be like, Oh, stupid SJW. Can't oh, believe Jesus he's doing Christ, this to man. us. Making a woman the protagonist? Oh. It's not believable it's because not about me. upper body strength. <laughs> <laughs> Which goes into play when fighting an alien. Yeah, really. Yeah. Let me ask you another question about said xenomorph. Uh-huh. Is it male or female? 
What do you think? Because it's definitely well, never really addressed. Yeah, I, per se. I mean, I think if we if we take, of course, what we know about the they have queens that lay eggs. That wouldn't be till I, the second one, but yeah, right. We don't know that from the first one, but if we take what we know from the sequels, then I would assume it's just a drone, just a worker soldier, whatever. So not not even meant to reproduce per se, right? Just there so to asexual serve the queen. Is what you're saying. Probably, yeah. Interesting. That's one of those things that just had never really occurred to me about this movie. Like, I guess in my head, I'd always been like, it's male. Right. I guess because it's, it's you know, it is portrayed by a male actor yeah, in a suit. Yeah, Badeja. Wow, what a name. Yeah. So, it is just inherently a little bit more masculine, I guess, because it doesn't have hips and boobs and a butt, I guess, right. or long hair. Maybe if it had long hair, I'd think it was a woman. <laughs> <laughs> or if it had Said a the long-haired guy. No, I mean, the, the classic fix is to just add a bow well, or you know, something pink, the right? The problem is they couldn't make it look female because no eye, no eyelashes. What? You put if, eyelashes yeah, on, it looks like a girl right Of course it would be right long away. eyelashes because only women have long eyelashes. I bet if you could peel off that top part and you get to that part where there's a human skull inside eyelashes. of there. Eyelashes. Eyelashes on yeah. that thing. Because, <laughs> you know, it's like in my head I was like, yeah, it's male. And I'm like, but wait, why am I saying that? Because uh, ultimately the face hugger thing, let, you know, drops an egg and well, not an yeah. egg, it drops a fucking full on creature inside of somebody. So it makes me think that it's female, but it also is the thing that like penetrates and plants yeah. the seed, which is masculine. And it kind of makes me think that maybe you're supposed to have again just psychologically this gender confusion where it's like I don't know what this thing is. Right. It's alien to me. It's this unknowable. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like maybe even psychologically they're trying to play on uh maybe just this latent fear that androgyny you might have or, of androgyny. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, where it's like I don't know if this thing is masculine or feminine. There's actually a really I good I don't know whether to say hey you like football or <laughs> make me a sandwich. <laughs> Those are my two modes of talking to people. <laughs> All the same old cliches. Is a woman, is a man, Bob Seger, turn the page. Saxophone. <laughs> but I, I think what got me kind of thinking about this is I was listening to uh, a podcast the other day by our good friends over on the Good Morning Nancy oh, yeah. podcast. They're they put great. up a, an alien episode, I think, last year, if I'm not mistaken. I was listening to it. Okay. And they're two badass chicks on that show so they were very much analyzing it from the perspective of like what it's like to watch this movie as as a a female yeah Yeah. so they were they were really talking a lot about kind of the gender uh politics going on in this movie yeah there's a whole lot going on it's a really good episode i recommend checking them out and tell them dead and lovely sent you (laughs) but i guess that kind of got my gears turning about that because i just never considered it before yeah you know let me see the dick on that alien let me see that that dick out let me see that vagina on that alien. when you see the the full alien its tail does come out forward like a dick yeah that's interesting to me that people don't catch the dick imagery yeah i know right (laughs) i'll also i'll I'll name drop another podcast here as as i was checking out other people's shows and and stuff uh in preparation for this podcast i came across a show that just warmed me to the bottom yeah, of my cold this. depths yeah. called Spook Factory. Spook Factory. It is a podcast by two, like, I think they're like 10? Yeah, they're is that 10. all they are? That's they sounded even younger than that. And it is adorable. All they do is talk about horror movies yep. from the perspective of kids. Yep. And they're extremely well-spoken. Yeah. And had some good insights and stuff. It was absolutely fantastic yeah. and hilarious and adorable. I'm glad the 10-year-olds are getting into podcasts. That's so cool. Like, I'd never heard a podcast by kids, much less talking about, like, the same shit that we talk about. Oh, man. Seriously, if I had a kid, I would I would really try to get them into that YouTube game. Yeah, dude. Like, that's the place. People watch kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man you know one of the things in this movie other than that whole you know male versus female kind of aspect that we have raging through every square inch of this movie right there's also this technology versus nature component going on throughout this movie too where a lot of the designs that are inside of the ship look very much like cardiovascular yeah. or like the interior of, of, you know, a windpipe or a trachea or something like yeah. that. 
And that has so much in common with the the xenomorph and the way that it looks too. It's uh-huh. got all these spiny, bony things. Yeah. And it's like you said, towards the very end, whenever it's hiding out in the Narcissus, it's like it blends in with the environment. Because, yeah, you can't tell it's even there. Yeah, there's kind of this blurred line between nature and technology. Yeah. And that's that's H.R. Giger's main thing. Biomechanical. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, dude. Oh, my God. It's so It's so sick. It's so well done, man. It's amazing. But, you know, ultimately, too, kind of along the line of that nature versus technology thing, I think that that's part of what makes this movie so effective and so scary. Yeah. Is that this movie does the same thing that Jaws does, and it does the same thing that happens to you if you've ever been floating around in the ocean at the beach and you see a shark fin off in the distance, you realize suddenly I am in something else's turf. Yeah. This is their domain. Yeah. If you're in water, you're in the shark's house. Yeah. That's where it lives. Yeah, exactly. It does all its, uh, you know, fighting and fucking. Yeah. And if you're in space, you're in whatever lives in space's domain, you know? There's this thing where when you put yourself in something else's turf and suddenly you're reminded, oh shit, like when I'm walking around the streets of Knoxville, Tennessee or whatever, I am on top of the food chain. There's nothing yeah. that's going to come at me that's going to try to no eat No tigers. Me. Yeah. Nothing of the sort, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But whenever you're floating around in the ocean... And you have this sudden realization that, like, my, my you know, species millions of years of struggling to climb the top of the food pyramid and finally making it on top. I don't even have to have hair anymore. I'm so, <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm so durable. I'll build my own home. I don't need body hair and tough skin and right. sharp nails and pointy teeth. I've got this. I'm like, I'm becoming weak and soft. I'm so powerful. And then you step into water and you're like, where am I? Yeah, exactly. Whose yeah. domain is this? You're suddenly not on top of the food chain anymore. And that's what this movie does so effectively. It's the same thing Jaws does. When you got these guys there out in a boat. There is no God. <laughs> you scream wow. as you float in the ocean. <laughs> My body is soft. <laughs> <laughs> Dead. Dead. But you know what I mean? It's like, it's that primordial fear that I think goes back to like lizard brain shit yeah. in humans, where we've not had to worry about being preyed upon, except uh-huh. for by other humans, right? for eons. And then to suddenly find yourself where you're like, I'm in the presence of a superior organism that can yeah. kill me, and I don't know where it is. And or all what it can traditional do. methods of killing it uh, release its acid blood, which will melt everything. Yeah. So. What do I do? <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. I, I love that that design, too. That, yeah, it's like, why don't you just shoot it with a gun? Well, because it'll eat through the ship if you yeah, do. Yeah, and that's, that's uh, a major plot point in Aliens. Yeah, That, that you can't shoot them. Um, yeah, they, they really do. They're, they are the apex predator here. And what you really just have is, yeah, Jaws in the end where they, they fig- she figures out just the one way that she can get rid of it. And that's all she can do is get rid of it. Suck it out of the airlock because every effort she's made to kill it has not worked. Yeah. Oh man, it's done so fucking well. So well. Like I said, it's, it's primordial fear and it's yeah. made worse by just that that claustrophobia. All those enclosed tunnels and low ceilings. Like, yeah. Really, Scott was saying that they had built the entire ship and then he was like, no, we need to cut like four feet off of these yeah, walls. Yeah, he wanted it to be tight, close quarters, just, yeah, cramped. And, and it makes it so much better. It really does, man. It really improves uh, the feel of the ship. It makes it does make it feel more like a womb that is going to birth something new. And I guess then the ejection of the pod would be like this release of an egg to be Ooh. hatched later, which is what we get in Aliens too. But and then you know there, there's so much interesting story in the rest of the Alien series that could have made a good movie. Mm-hmm. I do wish that we got that. What do you think about the soundtrack of this fucking movie? Because I, I never adore heard it. Of a Jerry Goldsmith. A Jerry Goldsmith. Now, who is he? This is, I think, maybe just a one and done affair for this guy. Right? <laughs> he didn't do much work afterwards, did he? No, just a few things. Maybe won an Academy Award for uh, The Omen. 
Mm. Maybe been nominated for Boogan Academy Hogan, Awards for Boogan, a million Hogan. things. Did he write that song for yeah, the Boogan Hagen song? Hogan, Boogan uh, Hogan. Everybody loves the Boogan Hagen oh, song. I know that I do. <laughs> oh my God, Satanas! Uh-huh. Love this. He did the Burbs soundtrack too. Oh, he did. Yeah, yeah, dude. The Burbs is great. Oh God, we got to do that on the yeah, show one day. I love the Burbs, man. I was hanging out with Justin Marion at Drag Brunch oh, the yeah? other day. We were just singing the praises of the Burbs. The burbs is so fun. Oh, it's so good, dude. The soundtrack in this is phenomenal, and apparently, most of Jerry's soundtrack was scrapped. Like he well, yeah, wrote, wrote like a lot of music for it. Right? They went with a lot more silence and natural, well, not natural, but uh, ambient noise because it, it helps you. To feel a part yeah. of it, if you're not being reminded by the you're in sound. watching a movie, yeah, dude. Like whenever uh, Harry Dean Stanton is in that room with all the chains and shit, uh-huh. and for some reason he's like drinking that water that's coming off of something. I don't yeah, know if you should a, be drinking no space tugboat water, fella. Space I don't know about tugboat that. Water. I don't know if that's got any vitamins or nutrients for you. Maybe it has extra vitamins. Maybe it's got space vitamins we don't even know about. Maybe it's vitamin water. <laughs> Which is great for you. <laughs> totally great for you. Yeah, not, not, not just full a of big sugar, sugar at all. bomb. It's yeah. not basically Kool Aid. Yeah. That should be their slogan. Vitamin water. Basically not basically Kool Aid. Not, not excuse me. Not basically <laughs> Kool Aid. Wash it down with a McRib. <laughs> a vitamin water and a McRib. Somebody <laughs> has had that for lunch. And somebody liked it, probably. Yeah, they were probably like, man, it's great. I don't think I could contain my tears if that's what I was eating. I would reach a point where I'd be like, (laughs) I've hit rock bottom. At least 50 Cent got some of this money. Gave up on life, didn't you? Didn't gave up on life, didn't you? You know, this whole thing, though, about Jerry writing the soundtrack and then them not using a lot of it, isn't that the same thing that happened with The Shining? Yeah. There was a lot of music for The Shining, and Cooper was just like, let's use classical music. The Thing. Oh, yeah, The Thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Morricone, most of his stuff... Didn't really get used, yeah. Does that mean if I want to work on a great movie, I've got to get ready to do a ton of work and then just get shit on and have my stuff, like, thrown away? Yeah. Oh. That's kind of how movies work. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. Yeah, like, a (laughs) bunch of people come together with a whole lot of ideas that they each then shit on and throw away until they come together to consensus and create a product. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's how it works. But yeah, it's like you said, the choice to not use soundtrack a lot, and when they do use soundtrack, it's very impactful. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, when I think about especially the moments of the movie that are so much better because there's no soundtrack. Dude, once everybody is dead and Ripley starts setting off that self-destruct sequence, uh-huh. and all you have is like the the klaxon like alarm sound and mother talking over the intercom being like you can't right. shut this down. There's steam blowing out everywhere. Dude, the feeling of just dread yeah. and doom during those scenes, you could not possibly come up with a piece of music that would make that better. No. Just the sound of this ship getting ready to fucking blow up and knowing yeah. that she's running around by herself. You don't know where the fucking alien is. Yeah, with a cat. Oh my God, dude. It's amazing. I'm so glad they didn't score that. Yeah. It, it works perfectly without any added music yeah mm. how do you think the special effects of the movie have, have passed the test of time they're still perfect it's fucking insane it's still looks great that's why practical is the best it didn't cost a lot of money dude yeah 11 million dollars in the 70s was probably more than it is now but it still wasn't a huge budget yeah the initial budget was only going to be like four, four million yeah or something. they were only going to get four out of it yeah and i think after he showed them like after Ridley showed him his storyboards, they were like, "Oh, we'll give you more of a." Yeah, a they wanted Dude, to see that. Did you see life. his storyboards? No, I didn't. The art is beautiful. Yeah, holy shit! Have you ever seen? Um, there's an artist, I think, back in the '60s, maybe called Mobius. You ever seen Mobius' stuff? Well, Mobius, yeah, Mobius worked on this. Really? Yeah, he worked on. He was part of Jodorowsky, uh, Jodorowsky's Dune. No shit. And he came over with. He had Mobius Peter. and Dali and all these other cats work on that thing. Well, not Dali. Well, I thought you said for the Dune thing. Dolly was, he was going to be acting in the movie. No. Yes. No way. Yes. What I the know. living fuck? I, I did not know that detail. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Shake it for the lobster phone. Uh-huh. Salvador Dolly, the lobster phone maniac himself. God, I love Dolly. I did not know that. That's yeah. fucking hilarious. But yeah, a lot of his like storyboards and stuff that he draws, draws out, the mm. art is beautiful. That's awesome. Absolutely awesome, man. So cool. Yeah, the special effects in this... 
like you said, it's it's practical. It's real shit. Yeah. It's meat and condoms and KY jelly and yeah. like There's a lot human of human skulls and yeah. Yeah, and bones. There's bones, a lot of bones. Yeah, There's like snake snake bones and stuff yeah. in, incorporated in crazy. Yeah. All over the place. And even a lot of the stuff that the ship is made of like they raided like old plane graveyards uh-huh. and pulled in huge sections of like plane fuselages yeah. and they wanted it to look real. Yeah. And even like in the, a lot of the hallways and stuff, like there's these big bulgy rectangle things, mm-hmm. box things that come out of the walls. Yeah. That's the back of old tube TVs. There's the back huh. of TVs. That's all that shit is. Huh. It's like whenever you watch Star Wars and you're like, oh, it's just a bunch of garbage. Yeah. You know? Well, like, that's how you make a movie. Tape a bunch of but garbage pre, together. Pre-computers. Pre now you yeah. go, oh, let's make it green and then put something in the computer. Exactly, dude. Oh, man. There's so many happy accidents, too. They wanted to paint the face hugger green. Yeah, glad they didn't do that. Ugh. That would have looked bad. The space jockey is not completed. Giger was really he pissed was, about this. Yeah, he... Uh, it's completed for a lot of the shots, but some of the shots he had not finished painting it, and yeah. they just basically tried to darken it in post. I never noticed. Well, yeah, but Giger wanted it to definitely be fucking black. I, I mean, I get it. That was his vision. I thought it made it look more like fossilized, the fact that it was kind of pale looking. Yeah. You know, which they say it's fossilized. It's been yeah. here for God knows how long. God, that whole mystery of the space jockey. Again, yeah. pre Prometheus and shit where they try to explain all of it. I just always love that bit of mystery where it's like, mm-hmm. what in the fuck happened here? They're yeah. on this thing. Ship is full of these eggs. It's had this thing bust out of its chest. What in the hell is going on? Although I will say, little discrepancy here, considering that that you know engineer, as he would become known, the space jockey, right. is like 30 feet tall, uh-huh. that hole busting out of its chest is way too big. That hole that, that busts out oh. of that dude is like, it, it's, you know, what? Unless their size is, their size depends on the host. Maybe it's like a like a, a carp where they grow as big as yeah. what they're in, you know? It's possible. I, mean, I don't know. They're not real, so. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's possible. Everything's really. possible. The life cycle of aliens is never really explained. It's not. Like, really at all. I mean, we know there's mm. eggs, there's a face hugger. Yeah. Uh, they kind of, I guess, pause it. Is it in the third one that the reason why the xenomorph in this turned out humanoid is because it injected itself into a human? Right. They tried yeah. to kind of backwards explain that they shit. They tried to, yeah, add in some... That's why you get the dog alien and the right. bull alien and all that shit. So weird. Yeah. They definitely tried to, like, paint themselves out of that corner, I guess. Yeah, that's where they started painting themselves into a corner. Was yeah, trying that's more to like explain. it. Yeah. Yeah. The kills in this are, are interesting in that it's very much like Texas Chainsaw. You don't see a lot. It's not yeah. gory, really, at all. Mm-hmm. Like, there's not... The chestburster scene is about as gory as it gets. Yeah. The that's android why it's so shocking. Rip, like, the android head off. It, because it's an android, it's not gore. Yeah. You don't get a lot. You don't see a whole bunch. But when it happens, it makes it more shocking. Yeah. That scene where Harry Dean Stanton gets, you know, the alien like blasts into his right. into his hat, basically. Mm-hmm. I watched that like frame by frame and realized it's like two different shots. Uh-huh. And it's seriously may maybe like ten frames long. Wow. Like it is a shot of the alien like inner mouth thing, like jabbing into a hat, yeah. and it looks like there's meat and stuff that comes out with it. A that meat la- hat. A meat hat, it's called. <laughs> yeah. That shot lasts maybe six frames. And then the next one is basically Harry Dean Stanton yelling, wearing his hat with like blood dripping over his face. Like huh. it, it, if you look at it out of context, it doesn't even look like the alien's doing yeah. it. Actually, the alien has his head in it like its hands. The process of editing this, and all Masterful. the post production was, it took them 20 weeks, I believe. Wow. They spent a lot of time making sure everything was perfect. And it, and it really, and it worked. really yeah. is. It's so it's so sleek. And like I said, it doesn't have to show you much. Yeah, that's always a great, great thing in, in any horror movie. The less you show is usually the better. That chest buster scene, too. I mean, legendary. Yeah. Absolutely fucking legendary. Yeah, John, John Hurt. Basically, the simplest possible way to do it. Have him inside the table with a fake body. Just shoot it through the chest of the fake body. The uh, actors were not told... When the squib, the, the squib was going to go off. 
or like how much blood was going to be there. And how much blood was going to be in there. Lambert gets just like full on just shot yeah, in the face And her blood. response is like her actual response. She Dude. was not supposed to be like, oh God, oh God. It's so good. You can yeah. like that. You can the hear her like walking fear. away from the oh, set. God. Like, yeah. Yeah. And it's when it's like showing the alien like kind of looking around. She's just like, oh God. Yeah. It's so cool. Uh, I will say they probably could have found a sleeker way to show that alien scamper off. Yeah, they they they, they used uh, an air hose, just shot like 120 psi through it, and it just up. But it just kind of doesn't like, look natural. It just kind of like glides on a track. Yeah, they probably could have figured out a better way to to shoot that. Maybe one, you know that's like one of the special effect shots that doesn't really hold up to me anyway. Yeah, but honestly, at that point, you know, again, in '79. When you're watching this the first time, you're probably so in shock that you do not notice. Yeah, and it's real brief. The yeah. escape. And again, bit. no soundtrack. It's just the dead silence. All these people yeah. being like, what in the fuck is going on? Yeah. So cool. Now, but, while we're on the topic of flaws. Okay. Let's just, you know, we've gushed about this movie quite a lot. But Gushing I'm not, not going to tell you that I think that it's literally flawless. I think there are a few things in here that, Flawless that victory. Do, yeah. <laughs> that do bear discussing a little bit. So, one that I just got to wonder, how does that alien grow so fucking fast after it busts out a dude's chest? Yeah, because it is, it is the face hugger for quite a while yeah. and then busts out of his chest and then is full grown pretty quickly. I mean, have several days Passed since since he died since Ollivander know. died like it's never really that clear I mean you could easily watch the movie and be like well maybe several days have passed yeah because the movie's not holding your hand it's not gonna tell you several days passed you're just gonna have to get that yeah yeah but you know one thing I was talking to Kate about this one thing she brought up is like okay whenever that thing busts out of its chest I know you think of it as being small but like with that tail it's probably four or five feet long yeah it's gotta be and it grows into a seven foot tall eight foot tall almost right. creature and it's like okay it was it was long to begin with right you know so but That's still but still man it grows a lot and it grows arms and legs yeah. which it doesn't have yeah. when it comes out of the chest yeah so that's like a little bit of a, <clears throat> yeah there's okay. a little bit of a flaw there maybe and then too like at the very end what's it doing sleeping in that in the narcissus it's just like having a nap it's not been wounded so you can't right. be like, oh it's healing itself but also it's like Again, not knowing the life cycle, maybe it was fixing to hibernate or molt. We know that they molt. We, maybe it's fixing to enter its final form. Maybe, we don't know. Yeah, we, we never, like, we, there's no reason for us to believe that the alien has a plan to end humanity. It basically is just surviving. Yeah. And its way of surviving is implanting its, its young in warm hosts. Mm-hmm. So, like, if they hadn't chased it down... Would it have killed them? Like, I don't know. Was it killing them because it perceived them as a threat to like where it was trying to nest or something? I don't know because it doesn't eat them. It's not killing them for right. fuel, you know. Yeah. I mean, later on, there's that deleted scene where it shows that it's been kind of making like a, a nest thing. Yeah. And it's got Dallas in there and shit. Uh huh. Pretty disturbing scene. Very disturbing. And they cool. didn't like use that in uh aliens, aliens yeah. yeah which is really cool it is really cool really really yeah. fucking cool but yeah i mean like i said the growth the whole nap there at the end like i don't know why it doesn't just immediately kill her yeah. but, but again maybe they don't see you know it's like maybe it's operating off of some yeah. sense that we don't know and it just hadn't noticed ripley was there i mean i'm kind of explaining my way through this it's a little right. bit of a reach but maybe it was asleep we don't know if it needs to sleep or not maybe it was like Take a nap, and then it was like, what, what is this? Man, this bitch is right here. Yeah, dude. Oh, this whole time? Maybe they're narcoleptic. <laughs> Maybe we don't know it, and they're just like, oh my god, oh, I'm starting to, I'm, I'm fading. I gotta find a little cubby to sleep in right here. All right. Oh. And it wakes up, and it's like, this bitch is still here? Oh, this is crazy. I'm gonna get her. I finally I, can. That's some little tiny britches she's wearing. Oh, man. Those are tiny <laughs> little underwear. She's wearing a pocket square attached oh. with dental floss, just Held between her cheeks, And I I'm guess. not body shaming, because she's a wonderfully proportioned woman, but she ain't got no booty. I have more of a butt than her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, may, you know what? No carbs in space. <laughs> That's no true. No carbs in Lost space, that man. <laughs> another, another little thing in the movie that I, I do think is strange. Let us not forget that there is a scene where 
Ash is revealed to be a robot. Uh huh. He is revealed to be very strong by the right. fact that he throws her across the room and it takes like three people to take him down and chooses his method of destruction of Ripley to be to shove a magazine down her throat. I mean, that'll do it. Will it? Yeah. I mean... How are you going to breathe with a magazine down your throat? It's rolled up into a tube. Yeah, but it's blocking <laughs> off your... <laughs> this is how the esophagus works. Okay. See, it goes straight down, but then, like, right off of there, yeah. you got your larynx. It's a hole. All right. If you were to cover that hole... No breathing. No more breathing. Yeah. Well, that's why if you're uh, eating food and you start to choke, that's why that happens. It's because the food is blocking off your your little breathy hole. Oh, got it. Got it. Yeah. So it would work, but yeah, it's a weird choice. Couldn't he have just like maybe give her a strangle? Yeah. He's obviously quite strong. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, he's he's very strong. Although I will say. Again, watching the movie again this time, thinking about all the the sexual subtext and gender politics. Oh, yeah, shoving something down her throat. Okay, right. not only shoving something down her throat, but also it's a rolled up porno mag. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, I can see that then. While she's in that bunk surrounded by photos of naked women. So then that's probably why they went with that, to and, continue that theme. And you know what else is on that wall? A photograph of three sunny side up eggs eggs females what subjugation am i right why is there a photo of three sunny side up i eggs? don't know but That's there's just like choice. naked ladies and three sunny side up eggs well i mean i guess honestly if you're gonna jerk off to something <laughs> i do love myself a sunny side up egg i don't know about that much but no. No, probably not. <laughs> and then he gives uh he gives parker a big old titty twister after that he does I mean, again, could that not have been just maybe a bold uppercut or something to get him out of the way? He yeah. grabs him by the chest and twists. And he, Parker, this huge dude, is like, oh, my titty! <laughs> it's like, twisting. Really? All the, and, and basically, like, all of my real problems with the movie kind of happen right there. Yeah. Weird magazine attempted kill. Yeah. Titty twister. And then there's the really bad shot of fake ash head, real ash head. Yeah, that wasn't a great transition shot. That could have the been done better. didn't look very good. Showing, um, us, showing us the same shot with yeah. the fake head than the real head, AB. Yeah, it was a bad way idea. Way too obvious. I mean, yeah. they could have showed him setting up the head from a different angle. Right. And then switched to the real head with the front on shot like they did. It, sure, It would have worked. looked much better. Yeah. But I do say, I will say... I love the design of Ash and all that like spaghetti and stuff. Yeah, he has in his like neck. caviar in there. Yeah, they, they put a bunch and of like weird marbles. Shit. Yeah, it's like how is this making a robot work? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not certain. Robots run on caviar and spaghetti. <laughs> it's spaghetti. <laughs> and then also do like that that last shot of the alien being blasted up behind the ship. Uh, I know it's real and that's actually the real guy in the suit, but it looks like a dang GI Joe. Looks yeah. like a miniature. I don't it know looks why. Looks a little weird. Yeah. What do you think about the pacing? Do you think the movie's too slow? Because that's something a lot of people say about I, this. Movie. I do. I do feel like it's a little slow. I, Man, I, I mean, don't. I think it. I think it probably earns all the time that it, it spends because of the payoff. But I know as a kid, specifically for me, it was just like you know, there's not much going on a lot of the time. Uh huh. As an adult, it doesn't bother me, but I can see where people say that this is slow. Man, I. It doesn't bug me at all. Like, I am so visually entertained. Yeah. I just don't care. Yeah, it's not it's not bothering me anymore. No. If it was an uglier movie, like, if it, if it looked like Alien 3, <sighs> okay, yeah, I would, uh, I, would probably, yeah. I would probably not be on board. But to me, this movie is just so fucking gorgeous every second of it. Yeah. I don't care. Just let me be on that ship a while. It's fine by me. <laughs> God, dude, this movie rules i absolutely love it me too man easily in my top 10 probably in my top five this is in my top five i'll just say this is okay. my top five favorite horror movies of all time you all got right. any any closing thoughts arguments opinions hints allegations things left unsaid you have some allegations <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, i would like to allege oh uh, wow no i this i think we've said it all this movie is a classic for a reason it is it is a proto slasher. It really helps to create taking, you know, John Carpenter, who worked with Dan O'Bannon on Dark Star, making Halloween, you know, his recognition that the character that 
is chasing doesn't have to be have an expression mm-hmm. doesn't have to be there to be a personality itself it definitely seems like it probably influenced some of the idea with alien where alien is you know expressionless there's no face to it it's in fact impossible to get a personality or even yeah. an idea of what it's it's uh Which motivations that, are that kind of goes back to that whole man versus nature thing i was talking about where it's like when that bear is eating you yeah. in the woods it's not because it hates you no it's because it's just it's what it does and you're yeah. not on top of the food yeah chain. so is it the boogeyman is it the xenomorph either way like it it brings out that primal fear of you're in shit. You're, yeah. you're, you're against, in the shit. You're against this creature who is perfect at what it does. So I love that about it. I also love that it really does beautifully merge sci-fi and horror in a way that is very hard to do. To mm-hmm. still give people the sci-fi tropes while it being this slow burn horror movie. Yeah. It's fun. Because like I said, so many things fail to deliver that thing where it's like when you're going out into space... You're going out into the unknown. Yeah. I mean, that's the closest thing we have to Vikings setting out in longboats yeah. on open water. Like, you don't know what the fuck is out there. Yeah, you, you can't step outside. Yeah, you can't That's escape. not an option. Right. You've got a direct course to somewhere that you hope you make it. <laughs> and everything in between is just hope. Yeah. Scary as hell. So, I, I think this movie is great. It's awesome it's amazing it's it's a 10 there's no yeah. like denying that totally man yeah yeah i'm with you for everything i've been blabbing about this yeah. entire this entire podcast it's definitely a fucking 10 and i i really can't think of much that i would change other than those little gripes that i had earlier yeah. but, but honestly it's like they, they really don't bother me that much it's no. like everything is so masterfully done that nothing ever really takes me out of this movie at all and i'll tell you this i am so fucking glad they did not go with Ridley Scott's shit ass ending that he made up for this movie. What was that? Oh, dude. Ridley Scott had this idea towards the the end of the production of this movie that at the end, whenever it's just Ripley and the Xenomorph on the Narcissus, uh-huh. she would try to shoot with a harpoon gun. It would have no effect on it. Okay. It would then punch through her face helmet and tear her fucking head off. Oh. And then... The xenomorph would sit down in the captain's chair. Oh, I did read this. Uh huh. And imitate the voice of Dallas. Yeah. And be like, "I'm coming on home, boys. Yeah, mission that would completed. Fucking suck. Yeah. That dude. That would be the real life. Ow, my dino head. Yeah. That would, would be that in <laughs> real life, man. Where if you listen to our Jurassic Park episode, you know, I just I want to see a cut of Jurassic Park that's all the same, except for when the Velociraptor runs into that cabinet in the kitchen. Uh huh. It goes, ow, my dino head. Yeah. I think that would be amazing. I mean, because a Velociraptor does speak in Jurassic Park 3. Ow. Oh, yeah. Shit. Alan? <laughs> God. Oh, Jurassic Park 3. Mm-hmm. But, dude, like, if they would have gone with that ending, holy shit, it would have wrecked this movie. Yeah, it would have been terrible. It, it would have sucked. It would have been like watching that gymnast do... 10 fucking backflips and 30 twists in midair and then land flat on their face. And yeah. you're like, I guess they suck. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because if you don't stick the dismount, everything you did before it, fucking it sucks. doesn't count. Yeah, nobody cares. It doesn't count. You got to land the dismount. Uh-huh. So if they would have gone with that ending, apparently like the studio was real pissed and was just like, you're not doing that. Yeah, it's a bad ending. It's horrible. Yeah, and the, the original ending of her just escaping on the pod would have been boring, I yeah, think. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, I, I think you do need that final climactic battle between Ripley and, and the Xenomorph, yeah. You are my lucky star. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Singing a Madonna song. Yeah. Way in the future. <laughs> Madonna. Well, at least we know Madonna on. lasts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of kids still listening to Madonna, even to this day. Hell, at that point, she's probably still alive. She's probably like a biomechanical Madonna <laughs> back on crazy planet Earth. witch arms. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> she's like shredding a guitar. She plays guitar now. Yeah. She kind of sucks. I'm sure she does. She kind of sucks. Yeah. And she still speaks with a British accent sometimes. Yeah. Why? I don't know. She and Lady Gaga merged in 2562. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they become Lady Mama. Lady Mama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, this this movie is a ten. I adore this movie. I think that just doing it for the show makes me love the movie even more. 
Yeah. I fucking love it, man. It's all it's always great whenever we get to cover one of these truly massive yeah, icons this is of horror. One of the biggest for yeah. sure. And when they live up to what you think about them oh, and yeah. even exceed it. This movie exceeded what I thought about it. Yeah. Oh, so good. Awesome. Now, Steve, next week on the show. What are we doing? I don't know. Maybe we should tell them to check out our Patreon page and stuff before we do. What? Maybe we should. Yeah. So, we got this Patreon. We got it. It's awesome. It's amazing. It's fun for everyone. The kids, they love it. They, they go love nuts. It. They jump up and down. Oh, my gosh. You see a kid. First off. You you dab on them, mm-hmm, do yeah. a little floss. Uh, you do the floss. Way, they love way cool it. With the kids, very cool. And then I, you, I, say, you plank. You plank. Oh yeah. And then planking. you address them. Oh yeah. You, you do a plank. Uh huh. You get leveled. <laughs> you get, yeah, you get leveled with them. <laughs> hey, you kids get leveled. <laughs> uh. Anyway, yeah. Patreon dot com forward slash dead and lovely. I got a few tiers on there. If you uh, join are they the, tears in heaven? Yeah. <laughs> oh man tears in heaven <laughs> tears on patreon <laughs> give me your money if, uh, if you join the five dollar tier you can give us a title of a horror movie and we will be doing a drawing just next week yeah next week we're gonna be doing one to uh pick a movie we're gonna be doing in august so yeah the fun thing has been this month that four of the five movies we've done were chosen by Patreon patrons. Yes. So if you want to help determine what we cover, go over there, become a $5 patron. Uh, let us know what movie you'd like us to cover. We'll throw it into the swan and we'll randomly pick one and see what we get. Last time we got 28 days later and then we had a vote for all the rest. Just go over there. Check it out. Send us your money, please. And that's why we need the money is because we throw these into an actual living swan. Yeah. They're mm-hmm. very aggressive. Yeah. We have to cover our hospital bills for all the bite marks that we get from They're these things. They're not nice. It's real shitty of them. Oh, it's God. Like, oh, Swans my God. Swan, awful. why can't I shove all these pieces of paper up your ass? I yeah, really. Get it. Yeah, it's for the patrons, we tell them, and it yeah. doesn't understand, and it bites us a yeah. lot. They're dicks. Really? Swans are fucking dicks, Fucking dude. dicks. That being said, on next week's episode, <laughs> we're going to be talking about a movie that I am so excited to see because I ain't never seen it. You have not. I love seeing a Kurt Russell about any old time, though. Yeah. And he's in there, right? He is. We're talking about a Bone Tomahawk. Bone Tomahawk. Yeah. It's great. Oh, I'm I so excited. It. So I'm excited we're finally covering it. Me too, man. So you guys be sure to tune into that. Leave us some uh, reviews on iTunes or your yeah, podcast right. app of choice. Oh, my God. It helps us so much we got yeah. some good reviews recently mm-hmm. i love seeing those on there i check them probably more than i should i'm constantly looking for validation from my peers <laughs> so do leave us some good reviews and uh make me happy about it so go ahead and do that they can follow us on the instagram at uh, dead lovely pod also on twitter at dead lovely pod we got a facebook group the dead and lovely horror movie podcast group got a youtube channel where we upload the podcast as well as uh, some OC. Mm, yeah, that's some right. Original content up there. Mm-hmm. What else we got? I don't know. We got a Discord server. Man, we, we got all we got this everything, shit. dude. We're loaded. If, you, if it exists, we got it. That's right. That's right. So be sure to check it Horses, all out. Horses, got them. Yeah, got them. In the back. Tons. I got like 30 skateboards. 30 skateboards? Uh-huh. Don't even get me started on my jet skis. Whoa. Uh-huh. You yeah, got a dude. Sea-Doo? One of them Sea-Doos? When you say, do I have a ski, a sea do you mean, do I have like 25? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Awesome. What do you think? I am a fucking is idiot. It, is it one of those like that's painted all radical from the 90s? Yeah, obviously. Fuck yeah. It's yes. airbrushed by H.R. Giger. Himself. Do you think that H.R. Giger chose the airbrush for his method of delivery? Or did the airbrush choose him? <laughs> but do you think he did it because like he was like, all of these people, they are using the airbrush and painting the unicorns and the rainbows. <laughs> I think the, the wizards on the side of the van. People are using the airbrush for the wrong purpose. I want to make dick alien. I bet Freud would have a heyday with alien. 
Yeah, I bet he would. But he'd be all coked up, so yeah. like you know, I bet Fraser Crane and Niles Crane would have a heyday with this movie. Oh yeah, they'd be like, Oh, it's trite and pedantic. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a pretty good Fraser. Yeah, that kind of came out because that's I'm not sick. bad. That's not bad. I at don't all. know if I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's over. It's done. It's over. Sherry Niles. You see, he's like, you need a sherry on the rocks. I do. Over I, there, do I, I need a sherry Niles. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. It's been fun. You guys have been great. We have been Uncle Ben. The Hollywood Steve. And or Dead and Lovely. That is us. We'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Don't catch a cold. Don't catch a cold. Man, that gadget. I remember watching Inspector Gadget as a As kid. we all did. And there's like a a through line where he's fighting evil villains yeah. but like i don't remember a damn thing about that show except like i watched a lot of episodes of it i'll tell you a few things about it that come to mind when i think about inspector gadget okay i think about how dr claw was yeah. the greatest unsigned death metal vocalist of all time yes oh, get you, get you. yeah uh-huh definitely a big influence on cannibal corpse true definitely I also remember being very confused about the relationship between Inspector Gadget and Penny, which yeah, was his niece. His niece. But he's or, a robot. He's a robot man, yeah. Yeah. So what do you think that Inspector Gadget's brother or sister is like? Because that's his sibling's kid. Right. Are they also robots, or are they just really jealous that their brother, Inspector Gadget, gets all the cool stuff? But maybe Jesus. he got like blown apart in like a terrorist attack. I, had, that, like, I assume him. that's what had to have happened. That like he had to be rebuilt. But he seems so good natured. He doesn't seem to have all the kind of. Well, like, maybe they erased like the trauma oh, from his head. Man, yeah, Ro- like I would love if there was a through line of him getting like RoboCop style flashes of his <laughs> former life. Yeah, exactly. Like, like getting real quiet and Penny <laughs> being like. What's, What's going the on, matter, Uncle, Uncle? Gadget? <laughs> and he's like remembering the shit. It's yeah. just like the Vietnam helicopters uh-huh. flying by, his glazed over eyes with his yeah. thousand just thousand flashes yard stare. of a woman saying bye, <laughs> and then blood splattering <laughs> on her face. And the he's like, "What happened?" Dark story. <laughs> Inspector Gadget. Yeah. What if like Christopher Nolan directed an Inspector Gadget I, movie? <laughs> there you go. His next project is like yeah. a gritty, realistic Inspector. Well, Gadget. you'd have to figure out a way to shove it up its own ass so, yeah. And, yeah and never call him inspector yeah. gadget or it would turn like out that. that he wasn't really inspector gadget the whole time he was just having a delusion <laughs> like three levels of delusion it was actually the dream of a robot to what? be a man <laughs> 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 <laughs>